first depends on eyewitness testimony. Of course, with something that where a crime is involved or a potential crime, you do have forensic evidence. But you're still depending for your basic account on eyewitness testimony. When you have a UFO and people see something in the sky or lands, there is eyewitness testimony. And the more I'm reading about the Ferguson incident, Chris, it shows how unreliable eyewitness testimony is. The stories were all over the place. Yeah. The officer shot the young man from the front, from the back. He was close. He was far. And then there was an article in the Washington Post about the problems with eyewitness testimony, pointing out that there's this group, a nonprofit group called the Innocence Project. And what they do is they look into cases where people were allegedly convicted of crimes they may not have committed. They look at the evidence and they pointed out that in about a third of the cases where people were found innocent of the crime of which they were committed, they depended in large part on eyewitness testimony. And that eyewitness testimony was found to be extremely flawed. So the question is here, of course, Chris, and you're someone who's done so much investigation, to what degree can we depend on what people think they saw? Well, you know, you have the the double difficulty of eyewitness testimony of an unusual, totally paradigm-shifting event. Sometimes uh, witnesses, when they see something, you know, horrific, uh, like a murder or something that really shakes them to their core, uh, you would think that, that that would be emblazoned in their mind accurately. And I think uh, sometimes the opposite happens. Uh, it, it makes people more confused. It just rocks their worldview uh, because of, of the event. And they have a very, very difficult time, I think, piecing together uh, the sequence of events, uh, duration, um, is something that I've seen oftentimes. Uh, sometimes it gets elongated. Sometimes a, a mere few seconds seems like uh, m- many minutes. Or sometimes the opposite. Sometimes you have time compression where a longer event appears to f- to flash by in a, in a matter of seconds. So, you know, it's there's no real rhyme or reason of how the human brain cognizes and processes information during you know, a a startling event. And I would think that a UFO sighting would obviously fall into that category. So I've mentioned uh, a number of times on the show that I've had multiple witness events where descriptions are generally fairly consistent, but the duration, especially a sequence of events, what happened first, what happened second, then what, then what, these things oftentimes get turned around, jumbled up, it's amazing. You can take people separately and interview them and, and then compare notes. You can come up with a, with a fairly, I think, accurate generalization about an event in terms of sequence events and duration. But sometimes it's hard to figure out because, because things are so all over the map. You know, this is always going to be a problem. That's why I have been championing for years hard data research with triangulated camera arrays that, that can't get this information wrong. You know, we're going to have to ask today's guest what he thinks about the future of ufology and and whether we can rely on eyewitness testimony as opposed to actually you know relying on on scientific instrumentation which i think obviously is the way to go well one thing mentioned in this washington post article is that people of course are not photographic machines and they make assumptions they fill in missing details and a lot of times when someone thinks they saw something some of those details were inferred, were assumed, or they got those details from somebody else. So somebody else mentions, did you notice that? I noticed this here. I noticed how the object made a U-turn. Now, what witness never saw the U-turn, but they'll assume it must have been true because somebody told them that. So it's a matter of not just of seeing the event, recording the event, but making assumptions based on what you hear, what you read. And that takes us back to any case that is removed by a number of years or decades. How do you get an accurate picture of what people saw? And of course, that takes us back to cases like Roswell, right? where we had the original story and then we had memories of what happened that go back 30 well, years. Yeah, decades. Decades. How do you know what happened? Especially if you're remembering something when you were 10 or 12 years old. Oh, my yeah. dad brought home this fragment of something and it seemed to be flexible and what was it well we can argue about that until the end of time 
Right. And, and I'm sure we will. <laughs> <laughs> Never ends. So we're going to do something here with our episode of the Paracast where we're going to go back through history and begin to paint a picture of the FBI CIA UFO connection. How are these agencies involved? How have they interacted with each other? We have Dr. Bruce Maccabee, who has written really an entertaining book. I didn't start reading it till fairly late, but it's the kind of book that is, as Leslie Kane said in a review of it, a page turner. It really is. It's a well-written book. It's easy to go through. It's not something that the prose is dull and distracting. It just takes you through the story and a lot of fascinating things to discuss. And we'll ask Dr. Maccabee about the accuracy of eyewitness testimony. A reminder, folks, it's here now, Paracast Plus. You get the ad-free version of the Paracast. You get a higher resolution copy, better listening experience. And it's five bucks a month for admission to our top secret download area. Speaking of top secret, we have a little fledgling chat room. We'll be adding more stuff as we go on. To learn more, go to plus.theparacast.com, P-L-U-S dot theparacast.com. And I even made it work if you just go plus.paracast.com. It works that way too. You can check out how to sign up and we look forward to your subscription. Dr. Bruce Maccabee is coming up next with Gene and Chris. You're in the Paracast. So here's what happened. I was placing an order online. The site went down. It took hours before it returned, but I'd already placed the order with another company. If your site goes down, you could lose business. And if you have a business or personal site, you'll want to know it's easy to run and it will stay online. At iWeb, your site is hosted on one of the most reliable networks in the world. Talk to a sales rep at iWeb.com. Use the promo code TechNightOwl for a special discount. First came Attack of the Rockoids, and it was a critically acclaimed success. And now there is the coming of the Protectors. A former military intelligence man is contacted by a space woman in a dream. A dream that turns out to be a nightmare, because evil forces on our distant planet are planning to conquer the Earth. This is gripping science fiction of the classic kind. Attack of the Rockoids and the coming of the Protectors. Find out more at Rockoids.com. That's Rockoids, R-O-C-K-O-I-D-S, dot com. Mike Stennerson from Midas Resources. At no time in history have precious metals been more important, certainly not in my 22 years in the industry. The dollar has lost over 90% of its value in the last 60 years. No fiat currency has ever survived the government printing presses. Ours is not immune. The time is now to be proactive. 1-800-686-2237, extension 116. Anything tied to the dollar is at risk. CDs, annuities, 401ks, IRAs, stocks, bonds, you name it, so decide. Do you want to leave a legacy of wealth or debt for your family? The choice is yours. Call me at 1-800-686-2237, extension 116. That's 1-800-686-2237, extension 116. Be proactive, not reactive. Call 1-800-686-2237, extension 116. The human body is extraordinary. Despite all the stresses we inflict upon it, it still works hard to stay in balance. Thousands upon thousands of people rely upon heart and body extract to help their body stay balanced. This excellent 100% natural herbal formula helps maintain healthy blood pressure levels, cleans arteries, promotes good circulation, balances cholesterol, and more. HB extract paired with healthy lifestyle choices like good nutrition and exercise can give you a life free of pain, sickness, and fear. Recapture your youthful vitality and experience your body body healing itself with the aid of hb extract it's extremely effective and it starts working in just days visit hbextract.com to learn more and to read scores of testimonials from satisfied customers and we've never increased our price in over 10 years that makes heart and body extract as great a value now as it was the first day we sold it a healthy heart is a happy heart call 866-295-5305 or go to hbextract.com 
Do you have relatives and friends that are convinced there is no need ever to prepare for any kind of emergency? Are these also folks you buy Christmas presents for? At 30dayfoodsupply.com, we can solve both of these problems at the same time. Go to 30dayfoodsupply.com or call 541-229-0010. We can ship your Christmas presents directly to them. Choose from our original $99 30-day food supply, our long-term storage vegan burger mixes, and other oatmeal, soups, porridges, beans, and granolas for everyday use. All products are non-GMO, MSG-free, and vegetarian. Most are gluten, soy, and nut-free. Call 541-229-0010 today. Oregon Trail Foods and 30dayfoodsupply.com keep prices low, cutting out the middleman by buying directly from their producers in Oregon. Remember, only $10 ships your entire order to the lower 48. Visit the website 30dayfoodsupply.com. Call 541-229-0010. 30dayfoodsupply.com. 541-229-0010. We'd like to hear from you. If you have a comment or question about the Paracast, send it to news at theparacast.com. That's news at theparacast.com. And don't forget to visit our famous Paracast community forums at forum.theparacast.com. We have Dr. Bruce Maccabee returning to the Paracast. Of course, we've covered a lot of his research over the years, involvement in the Gulf Breeze case and others. His latest book, written for Richard Dolan Press, it's Richard Dolan's new publishing company, is called The FBI-CIA UFO Connection. And that, I'm sure, implies a lot. When you read the book, you're going to see how he discovers what these agencies did separately, possibly together, what they know about UFOs, and maybe some of the decisions they've made. So, Dr. Maccabee, welcome to the PowerCast again. And I want to get started, like, in the real early days, the real early history here with regard to the government agencies and UFOs. So we obviously expected, as was true, that the Air Force was involved. Some people were surprised to see the Navy being involved in UFO research, certainly intelligence agencies. But why the FBI? Why would the FBI be interested in things in the sky? Well, the FBI wouldn't normally be interested, and it hasn't been for a number of years. But... Uh, the reason they got involved was at the request of the Air Force. This whole mess sort of started then when uh, Kenneth Arnold had his sighting on June 24th, 1947, and then that was publicized on June 25th, 1947, after which there were numerous reports of sightings, some that happened before Kenneth Arnold and hundreds that happened afterwards. There was a big explosion of sightings uh, in the early July, the first week of July. I don't know if anybody knows exactly how many sightings there were in this first flap, the 1947 flap, but Ted Blocher had a book, wrote a book called The 1947 Flap, in which he counted 800 sightings. And people since then have uh, looked up other newspaper stories and estimated it could have been well, well over a thousand reports in a period of a couple of weeks. And of course, some of the people, some of the witnesses were Air Force people themselves. Uh, you have to take a, a split view of this situation. In early July, there's a view that ignores the Roswell case. Why ignore the Roswell case? Because it's never been absolutely conclusively proven, although it is in principle possible to uh, find somewhere the hardware and say, yes, it was real. So you can look at it from the point of view that there was no Roswell, or you can look at it from the point of view that there was a Roswell. And as I said, if you do that, then you're basing your arguments on information that we can't confirm. So I stick mostly to the non-Roswell interpretation uh, while pointing out in the book but that does not mean that I think Roswell is nothing. I think it actually happened, but I'm not using it at all to, to make the arguments that I do in the book. So anyway, on the 8th of July, there were sightings at Edwards Air Force Base. It was at Muroc Air Force Base in the state of California. At this point, according to Rupelt's book, the report on unidentified flying objects, this is when the Air Force really took an interest in the subject. Two days later, on the 10th of July, the Air Force contacted the FBI. The Air Force told the FBI that they were using all their scientists and, uh, to run down these reports of strange objects flying through the sky. They wanted the FBI to interview witnesses to find out if there was any possibility of communist subversion going on. The communist aspect would be that communist sympathizers would generate serious reports of sightings to make the American people feel 
that the our own Air Force couldn't handle a situation, some sort of a threat that we, that we couldn't manage, maybe even give the impression that the Soviet Union was flying flying the saucers over the United States. At any rate, it looked like uh, something the uh, FBI could get into because of the idea of communist subversives being involved. And so the Air Force asked the FBI to interview witnesses and essentially decide whether they were faking it or reporting true sightings. By the end of July, Hoover had sent a uh, memo around to the special agents in charge at various areas in the United States. Each state had at least one person saying, uh, you should, uh, if you come upon a sighting, you should interview the witnesses and send the information to headquarters, FBI, and to the Air Force. Because of the fact that the FBI was directed by Congress never to throw anything away, that is, the headquarters, FBI, anything that made it into headquarters was stayed there. It's like a black hole. Information went in and nothing came out. Local FBI offices had a five- or ten-year rule that they could destroy stuff, but not the headquarters. In 1977... In 1976, when I filed the Freedom of Information Act request, actually I was interested in the uh, the Trent case I was working on at the time, the Trent photo case of McMinnville, Oregon, 1950. And I had found out that uh, Mr. Trent claimed the FBI had visited him where he worked. So I thought, well, maybe with the Freedom of Information Act available in 1975 or 76, I thought maybe I could get some information on whether or not Trent had actually been contacted by the FBI. So I wrote a letter in September of 76 to the FBI and asked if they had any records on Paul A. Trent of McMinnville, Oregon. And I also, uh, oh, by the way, if you have anything else on UFOs, please let me know. I didn't expect to get much of anything because, again, referring to Edward J. Ruppelt's book, The Report on Unidentified Flying Objects, he said the FBI had never been involved. That's what he wrote. So uh, based on that, I didn't expect to get anything. About six months later, in the spring of 1977, uh, I got a, a phone call from a very surprised FBI agent. He said over 1,000 pages. It turned out to be 1,600 pages of information in the FBI file. A lot of it was uh, copies of newspaper articles and, and internal memoranda, but uh, copies of stuff. But in any case, there was a pile of data there, which no one had ever seen until I saw it. Even the FBI agent himself was surprised that the FBI had done anything on, on UFOs, the flying saucers. So when I got these documents, I started reading through and comparing stuff with the, what was then the known history, mostly based on Ruppelt. But what the uh, Air Force was doing, I found some things in the FBI file that were Air Force what the Air Force was doing without, uh, it didn't appear in the, in the Air Force file on this subject, the, uh, the so-called Blue Book file, which includes documents that start in the late 1947, sightings starting in 1947 and going onwards. Let me just interrupt here for a few minutes here, which kind of surprises yeah. me here. We have Captain Edward Ruppelt, the head of Project Blue Book. This is the agency that's supposedly investigating UFOs. But... He doesn't indicate in his book that the FBI had this rather big investigative involvement? Well, you got to understand that Ruppel didn't get involved himself until the latter 1951. And by that time, the FBI had been out of it for a couple of years. The FBI really only investigated for a couple of months, about two dozen witnesses. And then they got a document from an Air Force person, sort of leaked to the FBI, I guess, saying that the real reason the FBI had been brought in was to handle the cases of ash can covers and toilet seats, in other words, the hoax cases. And when um, Hoover learned that, he said, okay, well, we're not doing this anymore. And he directed the special agents in charge, if they come upon any information on flying saucers, to uh, send it immediately to the Air Force and don't do an investigation. We're going to add something special to the Paracast Plus. It's a new podcast called After the Paracast with Color Commentary. That's after the Paracast. It's available only if you subscribe to the Paracast Plus. Go to plus.theparacast.com. That's P L U S dot the Paracast.com. With Gene and Chris and Dr. Bruce Maccabee, you're in the Paracast. We are. 
America's largest independently owned communications network, GCN. Is there a secret UFO agenda? Do strange creatures from the darkest corners of the mind roam the earth? Is there evidence for mind control, time travel, or devious government conspiracies? Find out the inside scoop on the latest conspiracies, paranormal activity, and Freudian phenomena when you subscribe to Tim Beckley's Conspiracy Journal. It's jam-packed with stories, special book and DVD promotions, and the best news, it's absolutely free, sent right to your mailbox. Plus, a bonus free email newsletter sent out every Friday. Simply send an email with your name and address to Mr. UFO at webtv.net. That's Mr. UFO at webtv.net. Find out what they don't want you to know. This alert just came in. This special announcement is for business owners and leaders of organizations who've been waiting for the right time to build. General Steel has made it impossible to wait any longer with rock bottom prices that could save you thousands. That's right, General Steel, America's leader in pre-engineered structures, is offering buildings at prices you will never see again. Don't miss these prices. A 50 by 100 for $35,000. You heard right, that's 5,000 square feet for $35,000. Manufacturers, if you need a larger building, try a 100 by 100 commercial building for $129,000. You can't afford to rent with these prices. Imagine a 70 by 100 foot church building for under $69,000. With the economy improving and interest rates still at historic lows you can't afford to wait so call 866-91-STEEL lock in your price now call 866-91-STEEL that's 866-917-8335 Hi, I'm Dr. Lorraine Hurley, and for over a decade, I've helped people maintain optimal health. I'd like to tell you about my choice of a powerful anti-aging antioxidant formula that also helps reduce damage caused by radiation. Z-Radical contains fucoidin, and there are over 700 studies showing how powerful it is. Z-Radical is a totally organic, pure extract, and it is available by calling 855-315-8326. Again, it's 855-315-8326, or visit my website, drhurley.net. Iodine is necessary, but Z-Radical is so much more. Hi, I'm Dr. Lorraine Hurley, here to tell you about an amazing pain relief formula. Unlike Tylenol, Advil, or Ibuprofen, Lavinity Pain Relief Formula is completely non-toxic and actually stimulates healing. Lavinity Pain Relief comes in a gel or capsule, and in my years of helping people, I've never seen anything like it. After rubbing a small amount on an aching muscle or a sore joint, many people report the pain is gone within a minute. Call 855-315-8326. That's 855-315-8326. Or visit drhurley.net for more information. If you need to say happy birthday, happy anniversary, thank you, or simply I'm thinking of you, ProFlowers.com is the key. ProFlowers has stunning bouquets, like the best-selling 100 blooms for $19.99. Plus, ProFlowers will include a glass vase for free. Sending someone a wonderful surprise of beautiful flowers sent fresh from the field is easy. Choose the bouquet you like, pick the delivery date, and each order is 100% guaranteed. Plus, all bouquets from Pro Flowers are guaranteed to last at least seven full days. Beautiful, fragrant flowers, picked fresh and sent to your loved one for lasting enjoyment. To get this incredible savings and send someone 100 gorgeous blooms with a free vase for $19.99, go to ProFlowers.com, click the blue microphone in the top right corner, and enter code PLOW. That's ProFlowers.com. Click the mic and enter code P-L-O-W. This is Jacques Vallée, and you're listening to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. We're tracing here the FBI's involvement in UFO research until J. Edgar Hoover pulled the plug with Dr. Bruce Maccabee, and his book just out earlier this year is the FBI CIA UFO connection and we're exploring the FBI's involvement. Now after Hoover said niet to UFOs, 
did the FBI give it up, or did they continue? What? Well, the FBI stopped investigating witnesses, but that didn't mean that they stopped being a black hole. It turned out that once they had established this liaison between the FBI and the Air Force, the Air Force often provided the FBI with information. And here's the real value of the FBI file and why I wrote a book about it. The FBI was told things that the American people weren't. The FBI had a window on what the Air Force activities were doing, combining FBI files with the Air Force intelligence files that we learned things like uh, there was a big confusion set in over how to explain reports. And that confusion turns up in the FBI file where they, you see the uh, Air Force blowing hot, alternately blowing hot and cold on the UFO subject. As I said, it turns up in the, F, in the FBI file. And you see some of it in the CIA, in the CIA file, too. The Air Force lied to the CIA uh, about the uh, possibility of interplanetary ships. They it, lied uh, to the CIA. Let's be more specific about that. Why do you lie to the CIA? That's got to be pretty interesting well, in and of itself. Again, there's a lot of details that go into this, uh, which are in the book. But basically, the CIA didn't really get interested in the subject as far as the documents are concerned until the big flap in 1952, uh, and, uh, and specifically after the uh, Washington, D.C. flaps that led to the press conference where General Sanford, the director of intelligence of the Air Force, uh, basically said uh, there were credible people making incredible reports. But as far as he was concerned, it was all natural phenomena. At that point, there had been literally hundreds of sightings over the previous three, four or five weeks so many that just about every newspaper in the United States had carried at least one sighting report. Uh, and uh, this was too much for the, uh, the guy who was the head of the CIA at the time. He directed his, his people to uh, evaluate the situation. They went and talked to the Air Force at Wright Field, or Wright Patterson Air Force Base, and they were told that uh, there was no possibility that interplanetary craft or whatever you want to call it, aliens, was involved. That's not what they told the FBI. The FBI in 1952, on the same day as this press conference, July 29, 1952, the FBI was told that 2 to 3 percent of the sightings could not be explained, and apparently the top generals, at least some of them, were seriously considering interplanetary ships as the explanation. Now, if General Sanford at his press conferences said, oh, yeah, we were considering interplanetary ships, the lid would have blown off, but he didn't. His office told the FBI one thing while he was telling the American people something else. To get to that point, 1952, there's a lot of history. From 1947 through 1952, the history of things like uh, sighting, flying saucer sightings themselves by all sorts of people, uh, including on-duty military. And uh, the Green Fireball saga, starting in 1948, and um, Project Twinkle, and a number of things that lead up to my conclusion that uh, the Air Force top generals knew that flying saucers were extraterrestrial, but they wouldn't allow that as an explanation when it came to explaining sightings. As a matter of fact, I date that to uh, the rejection of the estimate of the situation. I don't know if everybody listening to you would know what the estimate of the situation was. You know, why don't you uh, define that? We should also talk about the Robertson panel, but I have a, a third question to kick in there, but let's start with those two. Well, this stuff began in 1947. Immediately, the Air Force took an interest and began. People at Wright Field was one, the air tech, what became the Air Technical Intelligence Center, the tech, T1, T2, and T3 people at Wright Field, which was later the Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, and Air Force Intelligence in the Pentagon. These are two intelligence groups working independently but on the same stuff. And they were handed a bunch of uh, documents by a general by the name of Shulgin, who was in charge of collection of their intelligence. And he gave these documents to both, uh, both agencies, the... Uh, Air Force Intelligence and the right field. And they independently did their work. Now, the Air Force Intelligence people tried to force these sightings into an explanation based on Soviet uh, improvements on German war research. They said nothing about interplanetary. 
But the estimate of the situation, the, the, the famous estimate, was recounted by Edward Ruppel in his book. He said he actually saw it. That was written by the people at Wright Field, went up through the chain of command to General Vandenberg, at which point he kicked it back, saying, for lack of proof, we're told, according to Ruppel. And then some men from Wright Field went to the uh, uh, Pentagon and tried to argue Vandenberg into another uh, way of looking at things. And they said, again, he said, basically, sorry, wrong answer. Now, we have traditionally thought of that as being, well, there was enough proof for that, for General Vandenberg, but I think there's another reason. I think Vandenberg uh, realized he could not let interplanetary become an allowed explanation for any of the sightings, because if he did, that would uh, spring open a, a Pandora's box, which might reveal something like Roswell going on. You know, I want to ask you more about Roswell in a moment, only because we have that elephant in the room not being considered. But let me, so, let me just let me just be a little bit more specific on this. Before the estimate of the situation was shot down, there were a number of possible explanations for sightings. Uh, they, they said, "Could this be a U.S. craft, top secret U.S. craft?" And so they searched all the. Uh, agencies of the Air Force, research agencies and so on, and by the way, they told this to the FBI, too. Um, there was no U.S. project that could explain the flying saucer sighting. Then the next thing was, well, could it be from the USSR, the Soviet Union? And uh, they didn't buy that. They didn't think that the Soviet Union had used Germ had advanced German war research to the point where they could fly over the United States. And furthermore, even if they had developed top secret craft that could fly over the United States, they wouldn't do it because uh, a craft might get shot down or might crash, and then they wouldn't, their technology wouldn't be secret anymore. Just like we wouldn't fly any top secret craft over the Soviet Union until we absolutely were sure it was operational and immune from a disaster. So that ruled out U.S. and USSR. Then there was a possibility of misidentification to natural phenomena, uh, or man-made phenomena, misidentifications, hoaxes, of course, and mental states of the witness's delusions. And uh, the last possibility was interplanetary. So when uh, Vandenberg kicked back the uh, estimate of the situation, he set a policy, as it were, the policy being that interplanetary is not an allowed explanation. And from then on, you see the people who are doing the... the, the uh, Analysis work, uh, what became the Air Technical Intelligence Center, uh, Project Sign, Project Grudge, and Project Blue Book, all trying to explain cases without using extraterrestrial as one of the allowed explanations. And there was a lot of confusion setting in. I asked myself, why in the world would Vandenberg reject this evidence provided by his own experts? He, he effectively employed these guys at Wright Field to decide, also make all sorts of decisions relative to advanced aeronautical development of the Soviet Union and the United States and so on. In other words, they were the experts, and he was telling the experts, sorry, wrong answer. <laughs> that yeah. certainly is a typical politician or a military response. We have Dr. Bruce Maccabee. We're talking about the FBI CIA UFO connection with Gene and Chris. You're in the Paracast. A little right, a little left, but always independent-minded. The Genesis Communications Network, GCN. Attack of the Rockoids has been well-received by critics and readers alike. It's a thrill-a-minute story you'll never forget. A former U.S. military intelligence officer is haunted by intense dreams about a beautiful woman pleading for his help after a terrible battle in outer space. But the dreams turn out to be true and thrust him into a telepathic love affair with a woman whose faraway planet is intent on destroying the Earth. And now the gripping tale continues in The Coming of the Protectors. It's the second book of the Rockoids trilogy, a galaxy-spanning adventure that pits our hapless heroes against powerful, fanatical enemies that threaten the lives of freedom-loving beings everywhere. Attack of the Rockoids and The Coming of the Protectors. 
classic science fiction at its best, available now. For more details, visit rockoids.com. That's R-O-C-K-O-I-D-S dot com. The experts at Web.com want to build your business a successful website for free, just like we did for these current Web.com customers. We've used and and looked at other website designers, but there's nobody better than Web.com. Web.com can build your website in as little as seven days free. Plus, we'll promote it on all the major search engines like Google, Yahoo, and Bing. If after 30 days you're happy, we'll continue to provide promotion, hosting, support, and maintenance, all for one low monthly fee. If not, cancel and pay nothing. If you're in business today and you don't have a web presence, you won't be taken seriously. Call right now and you'll also get a free .com or .net domain name for your new website powered by VeriSign, the world's leading domain name provider. Call 800-297-0154. That's 800-297-0154. No upfront charge for site build, after which ongoing fees apply. Rights to site are relinquished when canceled. Domain included during active service, after which fees apply. That's 800-297-0154. Hi, this is Steve Sanchez, and based on a recent study, it was found that 57 million Americans had legal issues over the last 12 months, but only 60% of those studied sought out the services of a lawyer. Why? In a nutshell, affordability. While my friends at Legal Shield have created a solution that can help you not if, but when you need an attorney. For as little as $17 per month, Legal Shield will provide you unlimited access to qualified attorneys at an accomplished law firm for advice and counsel on legal issues, no matter how serious or trivial. For over 40 years and with 1.4 million families across North America, Legal Shield can help you, the loyal GCN listener. Representatives are standing by now to answer your questions, so call them now at 1-855-340-SAVE. That's 1-855-340-7283 or visit them at lsprotection.com. That's lsprotection.com. Results will vary from case to case. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Three square meals you'll need in an emergency. So the Freeze Dry Guys three square meal unit sale is just a ticket. A variety pack of tasty, nourishing breakfast, lunch, and dinner on sale now. Breakfast is Freeze Dry Guys' favorite. Hot oatmeal and sweet dehydrated bananas. Lunch is Mountain House freeze dried hot macaroni and cheese and crisp green beans. And dinner is Mountain House long grain wild rice pilaf and hearty beef stew, vegetables, and gravy. Call Freeze Dry Guy and ask for details on the 120. 26 serving three square meals unit. One case normally 164.37. Sale price at only 138.90. Save over 25 bucks. Get two or three cases and save even more. Or ask about Freeze Dry Guys Fall Chili Special. Always free shipping to lower 48 states. Call 866-404-3663 or click freezedryguy.com. And hurry, the Fall Chili Special and three square meals unit are on sale while supplies last. From the Freeze Dry Guy, the finest freeze dried and dehydrated foods available for long term storage. Period. This is Jerome Clark, author of the UFO Encyclopedia and other books. You're listening to the Paracast. All right, so we see this philosophy of kicking down any possibility that UFOs are not conventional objects, Dr. Bruce Maccabee. And we have a lot to cover here and not always as much time as we'd like. What about the Robertson panel? Explain that to our listeners. Well, the CIA, as I said, got interested in 1952 at the time of this big flap. They went and interviewed the uh, Air Force and were told that there was misidentifications and hoaxes and delusions primarily. The way the CIA document presents what they were told by the Air Force, there was zero possibility that interplanetary craft was involved which, as I said, was essentially a lie to the CIA because at the same time, they were telling the FBI several percent of the sightings couldn't be explained and interplanetary was one of the things that top generals were thinking about. Anyway, the CIA subsequently did some of its own data collection and had collected data somewhat from around the world anyway. And uh, Marshall Chadwell, a top scientist of the CIA, decided that uh, it was time to do something uh, right on the front cover of the book, uh, I got a, a few words from this, one of the CIA documents saying that something's going on which demands immediate, immediate attention. This was around the end of the uh, year 1952. He decided it was proposed to the government agency and intelligence that the CIA hold a meeting 
a panel to decide whether or not it was going to be worth investigating flying saucer sightings. And it's apparent from the way he wrote that he assumed they would find out that there were, they would conclude that yes, there was something strange going on and it involved, it required research work. Well, this panel was put together by NHP Robertson and it was carried out in the latter part of January, I believe it is, of 1953, over a period of four days and involved um, Project Blue Book people making uh, presentations as to supposedly their best data, including some films and so on. Now, these gentlemen who are the scientists who are evaluating the data apparently had little background in the subject. The big main thing, though, is they decided that they could explain all the cases. One of the most egregious, ex quote, explanations, unquote, had to do with film by a Navy photographer as he was driving across Utah uh, in 1952. He and his wife saw these disc-like things with domes on the top flying around. He had to get out of his car, open up the trunk, pull out his 16-millimeter uh, professional movie camera and get it going and before he could uh, take any film. By the time he got his camera ready, the objects were off in the distance and they just show up as points of light. I have one of the frames of the film in the book. Anyway, as this was discussed at the Robertson panel, and all I did was talk about the film itself, and they decided the film could be seagulls off in the distance. They didn't even consider the, the, the verbal testimony of uh, uh, Delbert Newhouse and his wife, who saw these things when they were a lot closer, and as I said, were circular with a dome on the top. But they didn't even consider the, the testimony. So it's things like that where information sort of falls through the cracks or gets modified, as it were. Uh, allows them to say, well, we can explain everything. And when they claim they can explain everything, all the interest in the subject sort of ended. Dr. McAbee, the question I have here is then, and by the way, please, if possible, keep the answers a bit shorter so we can get to more ground. Let me continue. Okay, so question I have here is we follow this pattern of, shall we call it, institutionalized debunking of UFOs. This is the surface impression we see, that everything can be explained conventionally, behind the scenes, where they're actually looking over this stuff. Is that what they wanted to believe? Is that what they were forced to believe? What they pretended to believe? Did they have another opinion, another point of view, where they did have to take it seriously? I guess it depends on who you mean by they that you're talking about. We're talking about any of the agencies that we've dealt with so far, the Air Force, the CIA, possibly the FBI. Were they all taking it really seriously? We can't figure this out behind the scenes. Or are they so involved in convincing the public they were conventional that they also maybe convinced themselves of the same thing? Yes, I have uh, considered the possibility of what appeared to be the... Uh, People doing work at Project Blue Book were sort of brainwashed themselves into believing that there was nothing to it. And uh, any, explanation in a, any explanation in a storm, Project Grudge was a uh, project from between some Project Sign, Project Grudge, and then Project Blue Book. And at the Grudge Report, which was publicized in December of 1950, the Grudge Report was called by General... Cabell, who was at the time the director of, CIA, of Air Force Intelligence, a worthless tripe. In Project Grudge, they, they prided themselves on explaining every one of about 300 cases they had looked at. And uh, apparently some 50 of those cases were, quote, explained, unquote, with the explanations being so unconvincing that even newsmen could see that there was something going on that was strange. But as time went on, uh, this uh, just sort of solidified into... UFOs can be anything but the, but extraterrestrial. And so what do you get at the end of Project Blue Book when it closed in 1969? 13,000 cases, 701 of them left as unexplained. And as far as the Air Force official policy was concerned, of these 701, all of them could be explained if they had more information about the sightings. In other words, so-called insufficient information type of sightings. But that if you go and you look at the actual sightings themselves, you find there's plenty of information available to conclude something was going on. Therefore, you can decide, as I did, that uh, 
there essentially was a policy undergoing, uh, and it was being driven by the Air Force. It wasn't driven by the FBI. The FBI was totally confused, I would think, by what they were told on the one hand, that there was U.S. and Soviet weaponry, and on another hand, it was explainable as natural phenomena. Uh, on, on, and the Air Force kept saying publicly how un, uninterested it was in flying saucer reports. Uh, well, the, yeah, the and that goes back to Van, uh, General Vandenberg's dismissal of the situation uh, back in 1948. It had a snowball effect when he dismissed the estimate of the situation document, which is fairly famous now. Uh, that's where we really see the first uh, indication of a of a policy of uh, denial. And that, I love that term, uh, Gene, institutionalized debunking and ridicule. Uh, it goes all the way back till to 1948 with uh, with General Vandenberg. I would I would think that it it kind of appears that way uh, reading through the section in your book on that. Right. Well, I was that's that's my my input, I guess, on this whole problem uh, is the re reevaluation or reinterpretation of Vandenberg kicking back the estimate of the situation, so essentially telling his experts they're wrong. My guess is he didn't tell them they were wrong. Just he said you can't you can't go public because if he had allowed interplanetary as an explanation, that would have leaked out. Oh yeah, the Air Force is considering interplanetary saucers as some of the uh, things that are flying around, and uh, the Air Force apparently didn't want that to happen. So he stomped on the problem right off the right off the, at the outset, as it were, by saying you guys can't use. I'm speculating. He said, you guys can't use um, extraterrestrial as an, as an allowed explanation. It all has to be U.S., USSR, um, hoaxes, delusions, or man misidentifications of natural and man-made phenomena. All right. By setting, that, by setting that policy, he caused a lot of confusion in the following years. Well, it's a matter of being politically correct, it sounds like to me. But get back to the other elephant in the room, the Roswell Connection. So if Roswell is, as has been interpreted later, an actual crash of an alien spacecraft, this had to be somewhere very important to the authorities, a huge undercurrent. No matter what they say publicly, they know this. And isn't that something that would have had to have gotten a lot of play in at least intelligence and military circles? Well... As you, as you, having read the book, you know that I do say, I do talk about Roswell, but my argument is not based on that. However, the, if Roswell were real and they wanted to cover it up, that would even be more reason for General Vandenberg to shoot down the explanation. If, if they had, if suppose the right field came up, with, right field analysts came up with the correct explanation. Yep, they're interplanetary, and. Uh, Vandenberg knows about the Roswell crash, and he knows it's being suppressed to be covered up essentially as much as possible. He wouldn't dare to let uh, interplanetary be part of the allowed explanations. Okay, so that therefore becomes a subtext in all this. Let's do our break, yeah. and we'll get into more of this. Dr. Bruce Maccabee is here. We've got a lot more to talk about. The FBI, CIA, UFO connection. You're on with Gene and Chris. You're in the Paracast. Independently leading the way for the nation. Compelling talk for every political persuasion. We are GCN. Genesis is defined as an origin, creation, or the beginning. Genesis Communications Network began with the mission of providing you with the kind of compelling content you're listening to now. And at GCNlive.com, you'll find a free archive of our nation's history, narrated by GCN hosts. Explore, share, and pass down to future generations. GCN is the future of talk radio, but we should always strive to learn from our past. Together, we are GCNlive.com. GCN.
We the people grow cotton, weave fabric, engrave ink, embed strips and fibers to protect from counterfeit and carting to a private bank, having it lent back at interest, forcing taxes to service debt. This capitalism or was Jefferson correct when stating a central bank issuing the public currency is a greater menace to the liberties of the people than a standing army? Hi, Ted Anderson. I'm placing a free silver dollar in a book that explains our monetary system. Call for your copy, 800-686-2237. It's time to understand the system. Call 800-686-2237. That's 800-686-2237. What good is a Big Berkey water filter? We get that question a lot here at BigBerkeyWaterFilters.com. And in a word, the answer is protection. Protection from water main breaks, E. coli contamination, environmental chemical spills, pesticide runoff, chlorine taste and smell, and all forms of fluoride. Plus, Big Berkey water filters are the original gravity water filter system and most trusted on the market for a reason. Tested by multiple independent NSF EPA certified labs, they are the gold standard in water purification. At only 1.7 cents a gallon, a single set of filters can last for 5 to 10 years. That means big savings. Big Berkey, the one that's powerful enough to purify stagnant pond water. Get a Big Berkey today at BigBerkeyWaterFilters.com. GCN listeners receive 5% off all ceramic filter systems. Visit our website or call 1-877-99-BERKEY. That's 877-99-BERKEY. Big Berkey Water Filters, for the love of clean water. Welcome back to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. And now, here's Gene Steinberg. With Gene and Chris on the Paracast, Dr. Bruce McAbee joins us. A reminder again, we've got that new service called Paracast Plus. You get the ad free version of the Paracast, higher resolution copy, better sounding and everything. The way to get it is this. Go to plus.theparacast.com, P-L-U-S dot theparacast.com. We tell you how you sign up for our Paracast Plus premium service. That's almost a tongue twister. Five bucks a month, 50 bucks a year. And we'll have more stuff going on. We're already breaking in a fledgling chat room. We'll have other audio presentations, videos, lots more to come. Beginning this weekend, we'll even be adding the special, exclusive, after the Paracast podcast with color commentary and more. Paracast plus plus dot the Paracast dot com. Chris? Bruce, a couple of years ago, um, actually it's been a little longer, the latest in, in what have you know turned out to be a long line of whistleblowers um, has come out. And he is the ex-CIA guy, uh, Chase Brandon. What discuss his his claims about Roswell and and whether you think that he was tasked to come out with that uh, revelation about a box full of documents or or do you think that he, that he truly was a whistleblower? Well, I understand he hasn't had a book out, <laughs> so he might have been playing up stuff to sell his book. But I don't know anything any more about it than uh, has been published already. I have never talked to the person. His story, if I as I understand it, is he was in a in a safe that is a big room that has a you can only get into it with a circuit secret code method and where they store historical documents of the CIA. Found found some box with the word Roswell on it, pulled it out, looked at it, looked at the stuff on the inside, said, Uh huh, this confirms my feeling that Roswell was real, stuck the box back in. Uh, so as far as I know he didn't say when that happened. But subsequently uh he went public in two thousand ten with it. Or 12, 2012. It was, I think, th about three years ago, a little over three years ago. Yeah, whatever. The point is that uh, he said uh, he hadn't been in that safe for a long time, but he didn't say when it occurred. Obviously, uh, all our CIA historians was reported as saying he searched through this safe and didn't find anything. Of course, the Roswell box could have been removed years ago or the day after. Chase Brandon went public. We wouldn't know. So that's a, that's a typical story that's sort of hanging by a thread out there, relying on uh, the uh, veracity of Mr. Brandon. You have a lot of friends in the agency. I mean, you've, uh, according to your book, you've you've given presentations on any number of occasions. You've uh, checked in with uh, friends of yours within the agency. Have you asked Ron Pandolfi? Have you asked others uh, who have been 
uh, close uh, to you over the years about this particular claim. And w- what was their well, response I, I, to this? I, I, that claim came long after I was at the uh, visited the agency. That claim was uh, in 2011 or 12, or whichever year it was. Right. Uh, never had heard of him before. You can, having read the book, you know that I was trying to investigate the CIA at the same time they were probably trying to investigate me. Well, that sounds like a lot of fun. <laughs> oh, I, yes. I, I wouldn't want to get into a betting match who's going to get a little bit more information than... <laughs> the story is outlined in the book shows that uh, everything that I published in there was, was in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, except for a few comments by Kit Green and so on in 2008. I was not unaware of uh, Chase Brandon until I heard about it through the grapevine that he had been talking. There was an earlier guy, uh, Harry Rositsky, Right. Who supposedly was um, the Falcon. Falcon in, in the aviary. I, I wanted to ask you about the aviary. And I've asked a lot of people at the CIA about this, and they don't know. they never heard of, never heard of Rosicki. You'd have to be in the same section of the CIA, I suppose, to get any cross-fertilization. Uh, right, so if you're in the CIA and you want to find out about somebody else in the CIA... Uh, it's a difficult process. Is that what you're saying? If if they're not in your in your particular uh, sex, yeah, you'd have to you'd have to know something about the person first in order to identify them as a person. Right. Person you want to talk to. You don't just go wandering around asking people. Oh, by the way, have you been down in the uh, in the uh, history safe? And have you seen the Roswell box recently? <laughs> well, uh, people have kind of. Uh, whispered around, uh, you know, wondering about your relationship with the CIA. Uh, you are very close with, uh, or you, over the years, you were very close with with people who were known to uh, to uh, work for the agency. Ron Pandolfi, of course, was the head of the science and technology desk for many years. I, I, he still may, maybe, I'm not even sure. Why don't you give us a, a quick uh, thumbnail sketch of how you were first brought in to brief the CIA and kind of take us through the the process of establishing your relationship within the agency. Well, as I point out in the book, the beginning of my involvement with the CIA had to do with photographic analysis or in this case radar analysis. In the same sense that my involvement with the FBI began as a result of photo analysis. But the uh, December 1978 uh, New Zealand sightings uh, that were publicized worldwide Right, the Valentech involved, case. Involved, huh? The Valentech okay. case. No, this is that was October of seventy-eight. And then December nineteen seventy-eight was, was a movie film, uh, multiple witness people on board an aircraft uh, in the middle of the night, um, seeing lights and getting film and ha- having verbal testimony, and objects picked up by the ground radar as well as the airplane radar. A very complicated case. The only one that I'm aware of that has had any, any portion of a sighting argued out in the open literature. You can see all that stuff on my website, which, by the way, is www.brumac.8k.com. That's the number eight, letter K, brumac.8k.com. Anyway, I wanted some consultation on my analysis of the radar sightings. And I first talked to a guy at MITRE Corporation, Gordon McDonald, and he suggested I talk to an expert at the CIA, which floored me. I never would have thought to talk to the CIA. After all, they were considered to be the bad boys of ufology, running the whole cover-up or something. And well, that was in December of 78. In that same month, the FBI and the CIA had coughed up about 900 pages of documents after saying that all they had was a couple of dozen pages related to the Robertson panel. In fact, they had hundreds of pages. So, but nevertheless, I decided, well, okay, well, maybe I'll do it just to see what the CIA is like. Now, at that point, I was still working for the Navy, uh, and uh, so I had a security clearance and didn't have any trouble getting into the CIA to talk about um, this sighting. And uh, I went there and talked about seven, I think it was like seven, Seven guys uh, represented different parts of the CIA, I suppose, who were interested in the sighting. And uh, after that, uh, I did get to talk to a radar expert. And I think I was at the agency three times. 
1979, in the spring of 79. And then I didn't get much help. I didn't go back again and had never had not planned to return to the CIA ever. But five years later, I got a phone call from a guy, Ron Pandolfi. I got a phone call. Uh, he uh, was interested in uh, the work that I was doing in laser-generated underwater sound. I call LGUS, which is Navy work related to ASW, anti-submarine warfare. And uh, he had noticed that this phenomenon we were using, the generation of underwater sound using a laser, you fly in an airplane with a powerful pulsed laser, you know, zap the water surface with a laser, and generates underwater sound that goes out from this zap point. And then you can use that to communicate one way with submarines in a covert manner, or you can use it to detect echoes underneath, which could be used in uh, detecting underwater submarines. Anyway, he had noticed that there were a lot of papers in the Soviet Union on that subject. Let's go into more of the framing of that in a moment with Dr. Bruce Maccabee. The book is about the FBI, CIA, UFO connection. That's almost a tongue twister with Gene and Chris. You're in the Paracast. First came Attack of the Rockoids, and it was a critically acclaimed success. And now there is the coming of the Protectors. A former military intelligence man is contacted by a space woman in a dream. A dream that turns out to be a nightmare, because evil forces on our distant planet are planning to conquer the Earth. This is gripping science fiction of the classic kind. Attack of the Rockoids and the coming of the Protectors. Find out more at Rockoids.com. That's Rockoids, R-O-C-K-O-I-D-S, dot com. Do you need a website? Well, you can get a great deal on hosting services with Namecheap's legendary coupon code. They're offering substantial hosting discounts on shared hosting, business hosting, VPS hosting, reseller hosting, and even dedicated servers. Namecheap is preferred by millions. It's backed by a money-back guarantee. Use the coupon code LEGENDARY to cash in on the special deal at Namecheap.com, Namecheap.com. Have you ever felt like the United States government knows way too much about your financial affairs? I continue to hear stories about property seizures, frozen bank accounts, confiscation of stocks and bonds. It makes me wonder if the U.S. citizen will ever again have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Unfortunately, with the Drug and Money Laundering Act, the IRS Revenue Ruling 6045 of 1984, and the Trading with the Enemy Act and Franklin D. Roosevelt's Executive Order of 1933, some precious metal holdings are subject to government intervention. For this reason, Midas Resources has prepared a report explaining the boundaries of trading precious metals privately. Whether if you have any intention of trading with Midas Resources or not, I have instructed my representatives to give this report out free. Call for your free copy at 1-800-686-2237. When investing, always proceed with caution. Again, call 1-800-686-2237. Exercise your legal right to trade metals privately. 1-800-686-2237. The Genesis Communications Network is one of America's premier broadcasters of captivating talk radio. We thank you for listening. Now, Now, just imagine, there are thousands of people who are just as passionate about radio as you are. But what you may not realize is how easy and affordable it is to advertise with us. Radio commercials for your business could be heard on hundreds of radio stations across the U.S. every day. We can help you by creating an effective radio advertising campaign for your company. From script writing to producing your commercials. Just like the one you're listening to right now. No other network provides the level of customer service we do. When it comes to radio advertising, we are your one-stop shop. And no matter how big or small your business is, we can help. Email us and advertise at GCNlive.com. And an experienced advertising executive will help you take the first step towards driving more customers to your business or website. Advertise at GCNlive.com. Easy, affordable, effective. The polar vortex is here and expected to freeze over part of the U.S. Help is needed. Resources are often drained by people capable of caring for themselves, leaving those with the greatest needs to go without. Do your part by being prepared this winter. A supply of Go Foods will provide delicious nutrition, comfort, and security during hard times. Protect your community and call Go Foods at 1-800-648-9753. 
or on the web at www.storefoodnow.com. Hi, this is Ted Anderson. Have you ever wondered why banks, stockbrokers, investment advisors won't talk about gold IRAs? They've been available since 1986, yet the financial industry won't recognize the value of gold for your retirement. Gold has outperformed paper investments, yet no word about IRAs. If you would like to have gold for your retirement, call 800-686-2237. Don't get left behind by rising inflation and low returns. Call 800-686-2237. Secure your future and call 1-800-686-2237. We'd like to hear from you. If you have a comment or question about the Paracast, send it to news at theparacast.com. That's news at theparacast.com. And don't forget to visit our famous Paracast community forums at forum.theparacast.com. Remember, once again, go to plus.theparacast.com. That's P-L-U-S dot theparacast.com to learn more about our premium package Paracast Plus. We've got Dr. Bruce Maccabee joining us. He was continuing a long explanation, and we're up to the Soviet document level. What else? Well, he wanted to talk to me about later uh, uh, the experiments I had done on laser generated underwater sound. Turned out that I was a friend of mine and I were the only people in the Navy who were doing work on this stuff. So uh, and we were we were aware to some extent of the Soviet work, but not it wasn't something we paid close attention to. So anyway, he contacted me on this day in uh, 1984, and he wanted me to provide a briefing on the next day for a group of people who were interested in this later generated underwater sound stuff. And that was okay. I had given lots of briefings. So I come up with a briefing for the CIA in one day with no sweat. Then a couple of hours later, I got another phone call from him, more discussion about the nature of the briefing and so on. And then he says something like, I understand you've been here before. And I sort of froze in my tracks, in a sense, because I had to admit that I had been there before, but it didn't have anything to do with laser generated underwater sound. I was certainly not intending to bring up the UFO aspect to him, but he basically brought it up to me. He said that he had been mentioning I was coming to talk about this underwater sound. And one of the people he had told recognized my name and had been at that meeting. That was Kit Green, Christopher Green. and. Uh, so that made me there establish a connection between UFOs and me and the CIA. <laughs> and so uh, in the following years, we would often discuss various aspects of the uh, UFOs, what are UFO sightings or stuff that's going on in the UFO field. Uh, I'd meet with uh, Ken Alfie a couple of times a year uh, as work on this laser generated underwater sound. We were close to a uh, attempting to get funding for a major uh, field experiment. And in 1985, for example, by that time we had worked our way up to the admiral level for presentations. We five admirals in one day. Pandolfi was there giving us uh, a security briefing at the same time, or rather briefing on what the, Soviet, the status of Soviet research is, is understood by the uh, CIA. Anyway, that, that established a contact, and... Uh, so I was paying careful attention to the people that I talked with the agency to see if any of them knew more than I did about the subject. Right. Yeah, you assumed, and John Alexander. <laughs> I sort of assumed that um, if they had somebody officially working on this project on UFOs, then uh, that, that person would know more about it than I do and give himself away somehow. If that person existed, which I, I, I assume they do, that person would probably be under uh, Pandolfi, wouldn't you think, at Science well, and Technology? Well, that's, uh, that's what you would think, but there wasn't anybody under Pandolfi. Uh, and Kit Green was the, the guy I talked to in 79. He was still there in 84. And uh, then he retired a couple of years later, and Pandolfi took over the so-called weird desk. I like that, the weird desk. Yeah, yeah. That sounds like my desk, just looking at it here in my office. <laughs> uh, 1987 was a big year for... Uh, Boy, I'll say it was. Uh, that The conference uh, in D.C. Uh, must have cost a lot of money. And, uh, yeah, it's kind of amusing to me that this recent conference they had last week, where they had four people, four people on a panel right. at American University, and I sent him a message. I sent the guy who put it together a message saying, you know, what you've done is not so unique after all. We did it back in 1987. <laughs> that brings uh, up the point 
uh, Bruce, who funded that 1987 conference? I, I've uh, heard uh, uh, mention that uh, a very kind of shadowy company called Cayman Tempo uh, was footing the bill for that conference. And that uh, one of the Fufor directors, uh, you know, who was you would think would know uh, was funding the conference, uh, being that they were involved in the, the, the actual planning and and. And, and everything for the conference. She, the director didn't even know who was paying all these airfares and, and putting people up at fancy hotels and feeding them. Can tell us about Cayman Tempo and their involvement in that conference. I never heard of Cayman Tempo. Oh, I, I guess I've heard of it, but it didn't have anything to do with us. Uh, the funding was raised by the Fund for Your Research. In 19, you know, in the way MUFON works, at the end of each conference, they tell where the next conference is going to be, who's going to be putting it on. And so, in the 1986 con- at the end of the 1986 conference, we announced that the Fund for UFO Research would put the fir- put the uh, the 40th anniversary UFO conference on the 40th anniversary of UFOs um, uh, in Washington D.C. At which point, it became a mad scramble for how do we do it. And I was the head of the fund at the time, so I knew all the details of what was going on. Uh, we uh, made an appeal for funding. We wanted to do an international conference, a real international conference where we had people from other countries for the first time. And we got funding from uh, uh, a number of people, contributed people, not companies, uh, a big contribution from uh, the Prince of the Fellow Hans uh, uh, Lichtenstein. Uh, and uh, hundreds of other people, I guess. I don't remember all the, te- all the fine details of the funding this, this long afterwards, but it was basically money raised by the Fund for UFO Research. And Willie Strieber guaranteed a certain amount of money as well if we, did, if we overran uh, our budget. Yeah, so wasn't we, that uh, kind of Whitley's uh, coming out party? I, I recall uh, talking to somebody uh, who was there that made the comment, oh boy, we're seeing the birth of a new religion. Uh, when the the whole uh, communion uh, hoopla uh, started right around that time, wasn't that his real coming out party? Well, the communion was published in well, February of 1987. Intruders by Hopkins was published in March of 1987. Uh, the the MJ12 documents were publicized first by Timothy Good in, a, in his book Above Top Secret, uh, in I think May of 1987. And then uh, Bill Moore and Jamie Chandray went public with what they had had since 1984. They had had the MJ-12 documents, and they went public with that in June, I guess, of 1987. I got all the dates there. Yeah, that's the that's book. a that's a major uh, that's a major row of don- dominoes uh, coming out in just a matter of four and months. To pre- precede all those dominoes was the Japan Airlines case. The FAA was investigating, so. Right at the beginning of 1987, you had a major publicity about UFOs when the FAA said it was going to investigate the Japan Airlines sighting. And then I give what you might call, quote, the true story, unquote, of of how I managed to write a big paper on a a Japan case uh, involving part of my investigation involved talking to John Callahan who at the time was on the government side, you might say. But after he well, he was the head of the NTS, NTSB, I think, wasn't he? He was the head of the uh, investigations. Right. Uh, yeah, right. And but five, ten years later, when he retired, he came out pro-UFO. Right. Well, anyway, you... the point is that the, the, the Japan Airlines case, with all the publicity around that, then the communion book, then the intruders book, then uh, MJ-12, all of these things happening within weeks or months of one or another, and then a big blow up, build up to the uh, New Vine Symposium. Let's uh, go uh, into that in a moment. We've got Dr. Bruce Maccabee with us. With Gene and Chris, you're in the Paracast. You're listening to GCN, proudly sponsored by UnseenNow.com. Lock down your digital life at UnseenNow.com. This is GCN. 
Graphic Converter is the image manipulation tool for the rest of us. It does not use any database. You get full control of all your files. Want to view the images of a folder? Drag it into Graphic Converter and a powerful browser opens up to show your image files. You could use it for slideshows. You could use it to import images from digital cameras or from scanners. Need to do some image editing? You can do that too in Graphic Converter. Also print catalogs. Convert from so many formats I can't even list them. Download now to see if Graphic Converter is good for you, like one and a half million other users. Guess what? You could save money when you buy Graphic Converter. Use the coupon code NIGHTOWL. Use the coupon code NIGHTOWL to get a special price for Graphic Converter. Go to LemkeSoft.com. That's L-E-M-K-E Soft.com. LemkeSoft.com. L-E-M-K-E Soft.com. Do you have relatives and friends that are convinced there is no need ever to prepare for any kind of emergency? Are these also folks you buy Christmas presents for? At 30dayfoodsupply.com, we can solve both of these problems at the same time. Go to 30dayfoodsupply.com or call 541-229-0010. We can ship your Christmas presents directly to them. Choose from our original $99 30-day food supply, our long-term storage vegan burger mixes, and other oatmeal, soups, porridges, beans, and granolas for everyday use. All products are non-GMO, MSG-free, and vegetarian. Most are gluten, soy, and nut-free. Call 541-229-0010 today. Oregon Trail Foods and 30dayfoodsupply.com keep prices low, cutting out the middleman by buying directly from their producers in Oregon. Remember, only $10 ships your entire order to the lower 48. Visit the website 30dayfoodsupply.com. Call 541-229-0010. 30dayfoodsupply.com. 541-229-0010. It's that time of year again, and you know what that means. Cold and flu season. (laughs) But don't worry. HerbalHealer.com has you and your loved ones covered with our safe and natural products. Cold and flu fighters like beta-glucans, olive leaf antiviral capsules, grapefruit seed extract, HHA four herb capsules, elderberry power, and respirate. And don't forget about oregacillin for the lungs, normally $34.95, on sale now for only $25. Vitamin D3, 120-count soft gels, only $9. Whole body and homeopathic detoxes for the lungs, kidneys, liver, lymph, and brain, normally $26.95, now just $20. HerbalHealer.com also offers correspondence course to teach you how to handle your health naturally. And as always, new customers get a free 128-page catalog with your order. Visit HerbalHealer.com and click the Winter Specials button to save on our natural cold and flu-fighting products. HerbalHealer.com, healing the world with nature, one person at a time, since 1988. For over five years, you've been hearing about the Berkey guy, so you may know a few things about him. For example, you are well aware of the superior quality and effectiveness of Berkey water filters and accessories. But did you know the Berkeys have had independent lab tests done to prove just how effective they are? It's true, and he can email you the test results. Just visit GoBerkey.com. You may also know that the Berkey guy has helped tens of thousands of people get better prepared. Now here's something you may not know. GoBerkey.com has amazing specials and deals all the time on a wide variety of survival and preparedness products, most ready to ship same day. Visit the Berkey guy at GoBerkey.com and be sure to click the red Products on Sale Now button. You can always call toll-free 877-886-3653. Again, that's 877-886-3653. GoBerkey.com, home of the Berkey guy. Hello, this is Rosemary Ellen Guiley, and you're listening to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. All right, so we're going back to this rather interesting time in the late 1980s when all this stuff was coming out at the same time, including MJ-12, and I want to ask you more about that in a moment. Dr. Bruce Maccabee, maybe you can go on with your considerations. Well, as we got closer to the MUFON Symposium, of course, the press started taking an active interest. People who knew something who were going to be in the conference uh, were getting interviews all over the place. I listed a number of things that I was involved in. And I was on Nightline and uh, 
couple of major newspapers, interviews, and so on. And then we had arranged to give a briefing. Well, first of all, at the National Press Con Club, the, we had uh, speakers from a number of different countries, as far away as Australia, I think uh, Chile and Brazil, no, Chile and Argentina, Italy, Britain, Canada, United States, India. Uh, I don't remember exactly all the countries we had, but a bunch of them. And we had raised enough money to bring these people over and take care of them and send them back again. So it was quite an expensive conference, but we did it with the donations of a lot of people plus the, the budget that uh, we expect uh, anyway for. Well, you mentioned Liechtenstein. Was it the Prince of Liechtenstein that uh, yeah. that? Not, not, what was his interest? How did he, how was he involved in this? How did he uh, get he, drawn he in? Was, he was interested in UFOs for a long time. I haven't conversed with him for thirty years now, I guess. But back in the late seventies and early eighties, he was uh, um, very interested in the subject. He had to keep it quiet because he was the head of a country. <laughs> Ahead of a country with pockets. With deep pockets, not much land, but deep pockets. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Every square foot is worth a million bucks or something like that. Listen, there's yeah. a lot of ground to cover here, and I don't want to keep jumping up with things, but we kind of have to because we want to get into a lot more subjects. Obviously, one of the big events in the late 80s was the revelation about these MJ-12 documents. Of course, we had Timothy Good mentioning it in his book, Above Top Secret. We had, of course, Moore and Shonda Ray. But the question I have here is because it's become controversial again because of this recent resurrected debate between Stanton Friedman and Robert Hastings, and of course, Kevin Randall doesn't believe in them either. What's your position about MJ-12? Well, it slants towards stands, but I don't use the documents, as you notice. I mention them in the book, and I mentioned that the CIA was apparently, at least Pandolfi, but at least it's puzzled with everybody else about all this stuff and having to do with Richard Doty and MJ-12 and so on. Pandolfi carried out his own investigation, so far as I could tell, and, didn't, and came up with a blank. I think the color twining document is real. I've held that in my hands. I've noticed this is the one that talks about the MJ-12 Special Studies Project, MJ-12 slash FSP. They're supposed to have a meeting in, what was it, 1954? At any rate, the document is yellowed around the edges, which tells me the thing is laid flat in a stack of documents for many years before it was stuffed into a, one of the file boxes in the, uh, the National Archives for more and to find. Anyway, uh, Okay, Dr. Maccabee, excuse me, I hate to interrupt you. Just wanted to stop on some point, then you can go on. Okay, the statement waiting to be found, do you think that was deliberate, that they deliberately put those documents in there so someone would locate them? Uh, I, I'm sure they were put in there. They had nothing to do, they had nothing to do with where they, where they were found in the file box. And, of course, according to Chandra they had received a postcard with a a return address on it made no sense until you knew what box and uh, file bo file in a box uh, to look where to look for this uh, document. You remember that? So the point is they, real they, or they, fake? They, they didn't understand what that what that address meant until after they had found the document just by a random search. So you don't subscribe to the possibility that Richard Doty or people like him are responsible for any of this. Well, I, I don't, I don't take any hard position on it. Uh, my argumentation is not based on whether MJ-12 is real or not. Although I would say that if Roswell is real, then there's something like MJ-12. All right, let's go back again through the history with the CIA and everything. And this is kind of a sidelight. You were active, of course, in the National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena, the organization of which Kehoe was director for a number of years. What was your take on the fact that the first head of the CIA, Admiral Hillencoter, was for a time part of the board of directors of NICAP? I know a lot of people were kind of suspicious of that. Well, I'll tackle that in a minute, but I want to finish my comment on sure. 1987 because it leads directly to one of the chapters in the book. As I said, we had arranged for a press conference for this, the international speakers. Then we had a special briefing for Congress. The uh, congressional aides showed up at the Rayburn building, I think it was, uh, on the day before the conference began. 
And then we had the conference itself on Friday and Saturday. Saturday night, we had over 500 people packed into a lecture hall auditorium. Uh, and for the first time ever, a collection of abductees uh, appeared on stage. Uh, and this whole thing made a huge amount of press at the time. Uh, and, uh, of course, Bandolfi knew about what I was doing, and, knew, and everybody in the CIA, I guess, had read the, read the articles in the paper. So he suggested I give a talk there. And so I, uh, about a week after the conference, I uh, went into what he called the, what he told me was the director's conference room, had a big long table, and uh, to an audience of 30 or 40 or 50, I don't know, people, standing room only. Uh, I told them about their own documents. Most of them, or maybe all of them, didn't even know the CIA had, had been involved in UFOs. So I told them about their own documents, and I talked about various cases and MJ-12 and all that sort of stuff. Afterwards, Pandolfi told me that I had created a lot of spies in the agency. So that's in one of the chapters. These people were using their top-secret clearances to try to probe into uh, any information they could get on flying saucers. And if they found anything, they didn't tell me. I'm not surprised because I didn't have a clearance level. And anyway... You want to talk about uh, Helen Coder, right? Because uh, of the uh, fact that, yeah, because of the fact that whether it's innocent or not, and this is a classmate of Kehoe's in their youth, whether that maybe casts a little suspicion on the organization. How does a guy like that get involved in a civilian UFO research group? Well, he's a buddy of uh, Kehoe. That's how I got involved. And that was the main thing that Kehoe trusted him. Uh, I remember Helen Carter made some public statements that were in the uh, New York Times uh, saying that through threats of retribution and secrecy had been maintained. Uh, I'm not getting the exact wording right. It's been a long time since I read it, but basically it was blaming, blaming secrecy for making it look like the real phenomenon was being covered up. I wish I could remember the exact phrasing that he used. Sure. You know, it was, pub was publicized. But he was clearly not against being on the UFO subcommittee. He, from what he said, it sounded like he was aware that the subject was being covered up. You would think also that somebody who was in his position at the time he was in that position would have had intimate knowledge of the nature of the cover-up. This is one of the top guys over there. How could he not know? all the details. That's the thing I wonder about. We can go into that a bit more in our next segment before we go on to some other subjects with Dr. Bruce McAbee. And by the way, I did get a note from one of the representatives over at MUFON. They wanted me to mention this, so I'll do it. The executive director of the Mutual UFO Network, Jan Harzan, has placed an online fundraiser on the Kickstarter website. Their stated goal is to raise $78,000 for a new global database for UFO sighting reports. You can see the prototype of the homepage for the improved for the improved database at www.mufonredesign.com. That's mufonredesign.com or go to the Kickstarter website to see a video explaining some plans for the new system. It ends Tuesday, December 2nd. So if you've heard the show before then, check it out. With Gene and Chris, you're in the Paracast. Great minds think alike. The network for the independent-minded. The Genesis Communications Network. GCN. So here's what happened. I was placing an order online. The site went down. It took hours before it returned, but I had already placed the order with another company. If your site goes down, you could lose business. And if you have a business or personal site, you'll want to know it's easy to run and it will stay online. At iWeb, your site is hosted on one of the most reliable networks in the world. Talk to a sales rep at iWeb.com. Use the promo code TechNightOwl for a special discount. 
First came Attack of the Rockoids, and it was a critically acclaimed success. And now there's The Coming of the Protectors. A former military intelligence man is contacted by a space woman in a dream. A dream that turns out to be a nightmare, because evil forces on our distant planet are planning to conquer the Earth. This is gripping science fiction of the classic kind. Attack of the Rockoids and The Coming of the Protectors. Find out more at rockoids.com. That's rockoids, R-O-C-K-O-I-D-S, dot com. Ever need direction or guidance? Ask the Light. Like to have a quick source of insight and inspiration? Ask the Light. Would you like an easy way to spread kindness in this crazy world? Ask the Light. Ask the Light miracle cards from AskTheLight.com were created in the aftermath of a true miracle. Beautiful underwater photography capturing the dance of water and light are combined with inspirational words to create the 53-card deck of Ask the Light miracle cards in a custom, easy case Carry box. Ask the Light Miracle Cards speak directly to your heart and opens you to everyday miracles. Spread some kindness by giving a card away. It's a great way to connect with people. These cards bring blessings to all that experience them. Experience the many benefits for yourself. Visit AskTheLight.com to enjoy early holiday specials. Buy one deck for $18.50 or two for $30. They make great gifts for friends and family too. Ask the Light Miracle Cards at AskTheLight.com. Alex Jones here. For the last two years, I've been working with top doctors, nutritionists, and chemists to design a nutraceutical formulation that has truly life-changing health benefits. So many other formulations out there contain toxic ingredients, synthetic additives, and even GMOs. Introducing the all-new Ancient Defense Herbal Immunity Blend, crafted with over 14 key ancient herbs and extracts to supercharge and prepare your body for what experts admit is the most dangerous season of the year. We have rejected hundreds of other formulations in our quest to bring you what is simply the most powerful and comprehensive proprietary formula that we have ever created in the realm of herbal immunity. Experience the benefits of combining over 14 ancient herbs and extracts with exciting new advances in nutraceutical science. Now is the time to secure ancient defense for you and your family. Visit InfoWarsLife.com or call 1-888-253-3139. That's InfoWarsLife.com. Don't complain about your cable bill going up and up and up. Do something about it. Grab a pencil and jot down this special number. 1-855-905-MY-TV. The more cable TV rates go up, the better digital satellite TV looks. Say goodbye to the cable guy. And get more of your favorite channels in 100% digital quality for less money. Call 1-855-905-MY-TV. Sign up for packages starting as low as $19.99 and there's no equipment to buy. You get free HD TV upgrade, a free DVR upgrade, and free professional and installation you control what you watch when you watch it record your favorite shows pause and rewind live tv even skip the commercials watch local channels too at just $19.99 what are you waiting for pull out your major credit or debit card call 1-855-905-MY-TV 1-855-905-MY-TV say goodbye to the cable guy cut costs and get more 1-855-905-MY-TV 1-855-905-MY-TV Hi, my name is Richard Dolan. You're listening to the Paracast. Don't forget, plus.theparacast.com. Plus, P-L-U-S dot theparacast.com. Check out information about our new premium service called Paracast Plus. And we start up with ad-free versions of the Paracast, higher resolution copies so it sounds better on your iPod, your iPhone, your iPad, whatever you listen to it on. We have a chat room, and starting this week, we'll be debuting after the Paracast, the After the Paracast podcast with color commentary and more, plus.theparacast.com. Dr. Bruce Maccabee is here, and I was just mentioning briefly about the fact that the first head of the CIA got involved in the civilian UFO research organization. And do you think maybe they kept him in the dark on any of this? He may well have known the, the, the big secret, but this was his, and this was his way of getting out information that should keep the, uh, the non-cleared people interested in the subject. In other words, 
a way of sort of leaking enough information and lending lending his uh, stature to the idea that there really was something going on without actually leaking any classified information. I presume you're aware that Conkler was not the only CIA guy to, to be in the NICAP. The Border Control had a couple of people, and uh, the last NICAP director was a CIA agent. There, there have been uh, allegations of, NICAP, of CIA trying to infiltrate NICAP. But you don't accept that? Well, I know that the, the members, several members were part of the CIA. Whether this was intentional or filtration, infiltration to learn, quote, secrets, unquote, the NICAP had. Uh, NICAP had a whole bunch of sighting cases, uh, 10,000 of them or something like that. That was the only information, really, that was the real value in NICAP, especially by the time NICAP closed in 1980. There is a new NICAP, by the way, which is on the web, uh, not related to the old one. Just taking an old name and rebooting it. Also, from time to time over the years, One of the other key figures at NICAP, Richard Hall, who basically was the office manager in the 60s. Kehoe wasn't in there every single day. He'd come in a couple of times a week. But Richard Hall ran the show, and some people talked about his possible military and intelligence connections. What do you say about that? Well, he publicly stated that he had been, uh, the CIA had tried to recruit him, and he had turned him down. Um, as for any other uh, any other aspects of his military, I don't know about. All right, let's move to some other case histories here. Obviously, there's a segment in your book where you talk a lot about your involvement in the Sicaro, New Mexico case, which to this day is considered one of the best UFO cases ever. So how did you get involved in the investigation of that? Well, I, I, I didn't get involved. I included it because it was in the FBI file. Ah. And an FBI agent was one of the guys who was one of the first people on the spot to interview uh, Zamora. As a matter of fact, they stayed up all night or until 2 o'clock in the morning or something like that uh, to interview Zamora. Uh, and then he wrote a teletype message, which I actually started the book off with, uh, the, the beginning of the teletype message. Well, uh, Bruce, you know, I, I read uh, the, the Socorro section, and I was I was kind of taken aback that uh, you never mentioned Ray Stanford's incredibly accurate and excellent book, uh, Socorro Saucer in the Pentagon Pantry. And you also never mentioned the collection of uh, metal scrapings that were bladed off uh, the landing uh, strut in the ravine there that was uh, subsequently taken uh, through Richard Hall's uh, connections to the Goddard uh, materials, uh, Space Flight Materials Lab uh, to be never returned. Uh, you never mentioned any of those things. Well, what, do you, what are your comments about uh, Ray's book, Ray's work on that case, and uh, some of the, uh, the interesting uh, subterfuge that went on with that physical evidence? Yeah, well, I think that's all true, but I was just sticking to basically the the FBI part of it. I copied the FBI, what the FBI had said, and put put it into some of its historical background. I wasn't intending it to be uh, the world's most complete analysis of a Socorro case. Right. Yeah, but wouldn't you think that a metal sample uh, being taken and preliminary results uh, being very exciting... Uh, given to Stanford and other members of his organi- uh, his investigative group there. And then, boom, all of a sudden the samples uh, are, are gone, uh, and, and they're, they're given a runaround by, uh, by these uh, individuals. And, and this led to a, uh, a pissing match between Stanford and, and, and Richard Hall for 40-plus years. Uh, I would think that that would be uh, something that at least should, should get a mention. Well, uh... If you had written the book, I suppose I would have. <laughs> Instead, I took up space talking about um, Clinton Ella's version, uh, Impressions. Uh, and as I said, I, I put it in there mainly because it was uh, the, it's the last UFO case that this FBI actually was involved in investigating, and that was unofficial. So I put in the part that had to do with the FBI and the part that had to do with the Air Force. I would certainly defer to uh, Ray's book if I were going to uh, try to do a major 
investigation of the Sakaro case. I do know that, uh, you know, the film that was taken from Officer Jordan uh, and, and not returned because uh, it, it had been fogged. You know that Hynek later, in a videotape interview with Stanford uh, a number of years later, did confirm that the film was damaged by radiation and that it wasn't a return to Jordan right away because it might hold clues to an exotic propulsion system. Are you aware that Hynek went on the record publicly and stated that? No. Oh, no, I may have been years ago. I don't remember it, though. Ray's book, Jordan, uh, signed an affidavit uh, telling exactly what happened with that film. And I think that's a key piece of evidence for for Socorro, along with the metal sample that was uh, gathered by by Ray with witnesses, uh, a completely intact evidence chain all the way to Goddard Space Flight Center and the materials lab. Uh, the, I think the Socorro case is one of the bedrock cases, I think, of ufology. And and these uh, very, very important details, I think, are, are something that the public uh, you know needs to be reminded of. And uh, the fact that there was a lot of runaround uh, by official government uh, people, the, the Air Force, uh, the FBI, and others, uh, really did, um, you know, create some barriers for, for the truth to come out about the case. Uh, would you agree with that? Well, yeah, I'd agree with that. Also, the skeptics <laughs> tried to put the kibosh on the case, you know, classes explanation that it was a, a big hoax by uh, the, on a part of the um, mayor and stuff like that. But like I said, I was not trying to do a 100% definitive analysis of uh, the Socorro case. I was confining myself to basically what was in the FBI documents. Right. Well, did you know that two days after the Socorro case, that a, um, a plant materials analysis, uh, who is uh, an expert in radiation biology, was rushed to the site on Sunday, the 26th of 1964, April 1964, and was accompanied by... Air Force Major William Connor and Sergeant David Moody, they brought radiation detecting equipment uh, that was provided by, I think, FBI agent, uh, uh, if I believe, if, Burns. If, if memory serves me correct. Uh, do you know the results? Uh, did you ever hear the results of that, uh, that plant analysis? Not that I recall. Yeah, yeah. There's so much about Socorro that uh, there's little nuances uh, here and there that do include involvement uh, by the CIA or by the FBI, rather. And again, I think these are important facts that should be brought out uh, about the. Yeah, they're, they're, these are just a few of the facts that should be brought out about this case that I think are extremely important. Bruce. Yes. Go ahead. You want to finish up before we break? Well, as I said, I was confining myself what I found in the FBI file, plus a little bit of. Added, added information. I wasn't trying to do um, 100% definitive analysis of the, of the Socorro case. If I were, I certainly would include all the stuff you've been talking about. All right, fair enough. We'll leave it at that. We'll get on to some other subjects in our next segment. By the way, we also have a few questions from listeners. We're going to try to get a few of them in there, but obviously we have so many things to talk about with a book like this, a book of the scope that we can't cover everything. I also want to touch a little bit about the possible interest by the Clintons in UFOs and a certain report prepared for them. Neighbors, we don't always get a chance to pre-announce a guest that far in advance, but we do have Peter Robbins scheduled for the Powercast next week. Of course, he was one of those responsible for Left at Eastgate, the book on the Rendlesham case. He's done a lot of work on abductions. That's Peter Robbins coming next week on the show. We've got more to come. With Gene and Chris, we're talking to Dr. Bruce Maccabee. You're in the Paracast. You're listening to GCN, proudly sponsored by UnseenNow.com. Lock down your digital life at UnseenNow.com. This is GCN. This is Dan Pilla. Do you owe the IRS money you can't pay? Are tax debts crippling you? I've defended people from the IRS for over 30 years. I've helped thousands and I can help you too. I wrote the book on IRS settlement and I'm telling you, there's no such thing as a hopeless case. Call 800-34-NO-TAX to finally get free of IRS debt. With the IRS's new programs, there's never been a better time to solve your problem. Call 800-34-NO-TAX. That's 800-34-NO-TAX or my website, danpilla.com. 
Hi, this is Ted Anderson. Have you ever wondered why banks, stockbrokers, investment advisors won't talk about gold IRAs? They've been available since 1986, yet the financial industry won't recognize the value of gold for your retirement. Gold has outperformed paper investments, yet no word about IRAs. If you would like to have gold for your retirement, call 800-686-2237. Don't get left behind by rising inflation and low returns. Call 800-686-2237. Secure your future and call 1-800-686-2237. The human body is extraordinary. Despite all the stresses we inflict upon it, it still works hard to stay in balance. Thousands upon thousands of people rely upon heart and body extract to help their body stay balanced. This excellent 100% natural herbal formula helps maintain healthy blood pressure levels, cleans arteries, promotes good circulation, balances cholesterol, and more. HB extract paired with healthy lifestyle choices like good nutrition and exercise can give you a life free of pain, sickness, and fear. Recapture your youthful vitality and experience your body healing itself with the aid of HB extract. It's extremely effective and it starts working in just days. Visit hbextract.com to learn more and to read scores of testimonials from satisfied customers. And we've never increased our price in over 10 years. That makes heart and body extract as great a value now as it was the first day we sold it. A healthy heart is a happy heart. Call 866-295-5305 or go to hbextract.com. Welcome back to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. And now, here's Gene Steinberg. Dr. Bruce McAbee's here about the FBI, CIA, UFO connection. And as I said, we got a lot of ground to cover, so I'm kind of jumping through topics and years and we can't spend, you know, an hour on each one, but I'll try our best. Just looking at maybe a summary as we get to our final third of the show here. As we look over the interest of these agencies in the subject, is there something to disclose behind those closed doors of secrecy? Is there a real truth to be had? Because people have been asking year after year for disclosure, for disclosure. What's your take on it? Most of the FBI stuff was... I uh, completed in the late 50s, uh, and uh, except for the Sequel case, uh, one case which apparently was an abduction in 1967. CIA might have something to confess, but they didn't confess it to me <laughs> when I was there, so I don't know for sure. So does anybody, any agency within the government, do you think, have all this secret knowledge about Roswell, if it was real, possible other cases, something to say, hey, we're being visited by E.T. or whatever. What guilty knowledge the government has? Does an agency have the secret? Do they really know? Is there a, something that we can get them to disclose? Or is that just an uh, excuse uh, disclosure? Based on based on Vandenberg's action of kicking, you know, rejecting the, uh, the estimate, I would say the Air Force intelligence has been a point squad on this all along. If anybody has to confess covering up as the Air Force, um, as I try to do in my book, demonstrate that they did orchestrate a cover up uh, by reje rejecting, not, not allowing uh, interplanetary to be a possible explanation for any UFO sighting. And I, I also pointed out in the book the fact that I did not find clear evidence of a uh, CIA covering up stuff did not mean that there was no secret a secret group uh, along with Alexander. I assume there is a secret group somewhere. Alexander John Alexander in his book argues that he was never able to find that secret group, and I wasn't able to find it either. But uh, I uh, defer to Kit Green's comment that uh, he had interviewed a number of people, and some people top level people, and he. Some people knew something and some didn't, but it gave them the impression that there was something going on somewhere. They just couldn't get to it. My guess is that it's a contractor type of operation where there's a very thin pipeline, not many people are aware of a lot of money that's flowing to some contractor, analyzing what's, what, what's a, whatever's available. Clearly, if Roswell is real and there's crash debris and bodies, there's some major work going on somewhere. Uh, at the very least, they're controlling access to the information. 
of Roswell, if there have been no crashes, there's still uh, a cover-up of the conclusion that some of these things seen in the sky are interplanetary. So would the point people responsible for this secret be largely in private industry with maybe just a few people in the government in on what's going on? That's what I would say. You minimize the number of people who know the secret in order to minimize the possibility that it gets out. And depending on who, who it is in the government that knows the secret, uh, it's probably the government is probably less trustworthy. Government employees may be less trustworthy than contractor employees in this regard. But the real question comes down to why don't they let us know what's really going on? Uh, is there something that they know that we don't that makes it clear that it would be detrimental to civilization or something like that? If uh, they were to have, quote, complete disclosure, unquote. Well, what about the Office of Naval Intelligence? You were in the Navy. I've been hearing uh, whisperings uh, all over the place over the years about the involvement of the uh, ONI in investigating UFOs and in having some sort of uh, a presence in this particular subject. Over the years, what have you heard about ONI's uh, uh, knowledge? Do you think that they're involved in back, any sort of cover-up? Back in the late 70s, I did the Freedom of Information Act request to the Office of Naval Intelligence for any information on UFOs. And they sent me a couple of pages of analysis of uh, the Tremonton and uh, Utah films. The film that I talked about earlier, done by the, the Na National Photo Interpretation Center. Uh, they had copies of the documents written by the photo interpretation guys. Now, I sent the... Uh, Freedom of Information Act guy, a copy of a document I found in the FBI file, which was a report of uh, by naval aviators in Alaska uh, seeing balls of light flying around and then chasing the balls of light and so on. This is where they had airplanes up there all the time uh, in case of Soviet incursions across the Bering Strait. So I, I not only did I ask them for the documents, I said, here they are. Can you find these? And there was a document related to uh, these sightings in Alaska, and it had commentary on it by uh, some operational Navy research group, Op 344 or whatever the number was, something like that. And I sent that to the uh, Freedom of Information Act guy by the name of Koshalis, and he said they searched all up and down, left, right, and sideways. They weren't even able to find the document that I had, and so it only existed in the FBI file, I guess. Uh, and they couldn't find anything else other than these photo interpretation and analyses of the uh, Tremonton and uh, Great Falls movies. Well, it sounds like was, uh, my Freedom of Information Act didn't turn off anything that the Navy was doing. Uh -huh. It sounds like uh, they've been really covering their tracks pretty well, don't you think? Well, they would have covered their tracks very well, yes. Uh, you'll hear about things like... Uh, tracking fast-moving underwater objects in the tongue of the ocean or uh, Navy cases uh, like that. Or, and you might include uh, the um, Operation Main Brace cases in September of 1952 as Navy. Uh, so I don't know why they didn't have anything related to that. Example. Yeah, it's interesting. I remember reading the incredible statistic uh, stated by Ivan T. Sanderson in his book, Invisible Residence, which is about submerged uh, UFOs and, and UFOs in water. And he made the outrageous statement that 50 percent of all UFO sightings uh, are somehow connected with bodies of water. So you would think that the Navy, if that's true, the Navy would have uh, a voluminous files on on uh, you know cases that involve UFOs and water. I, it's it's mind blowing to me that uh, there's almost no FOIA results coming back uh, from from the Navy. Yeah, well, I never. Uh, I, I know some people who are in the Navy, the Navy laboratories who are interested in the subject. Um, but they didn't indicate that there was a, they were part of a research group de devoted to uh, UFO analysis. I, I spoke at a, uh, gave a lecture at 
Uh, we made a bunch of like China Lake one time, and we went out for dinner afterwards with a bunch of people. Uh, people were throwing out, throwing things around, so on. But again, there was no indication that there was somebody there who knew a lot more than I did, uh, or was covering up some sort of an ongoing research group. Did anyone from the military ever come to you and say, you know what, you're kind of walking on eggshells here, maybe move away? from a particular topic or exploration? No, well, the place that I work told me, we don't care what you're doing in your spare time, as long as you don't get us involved, that is the name of the laboratory. So I would say I work for the Navy, but I wouldn't, wouldn't put the uh, name of the laboratory on it. Of course, I put it in my book because it's all years old, years ago now, uh, at the time. Uh, there was one time when I was reprimanded for giving a UFO lecture to a group of um, uh, Retired Air Force colonels, uh, and this lecture was given at uh, Fort Myers in Washington D.C. Uh, and after I gave this lecture and talked about some, uh, uh, talked about uh, nuclear UFOs over our nuclear site, this, this lecture was way back in the early '80s. Let's find out what happened when you gave that lecture in our next segment. Dr. Bruce Maccabee is here. With Gene and Chris, you're in the Paracast. Neighbors, are you tired of dealing with a slow web hosting provider? Well, check out A2 Hosting and their screaming fast Swift server platform. They even have SSDs that load pages 300% faster than the competition. Ready to give your site a speed boost? Well, tell you what, neighbors, head on over to a2hosting.com. That's A2, that's number two, a2hosting.com. Check out their Prime Hosting account. And get this, neighbors, they're even giving you an exclusive 25% off discount for all our listeners. 25%. And remember, their Guru Crew support team is standing by 24 7 365 days a year to answer any of your questions. Now, to get the discount, use the coupon code GENE when you check out. On the average, Americans work between 45 to 50 years hoping to build up enough wealth to retire and live out their golden years. Unfortunately, with taxation, the rising cost of food, energy, housing, and medical, many retirees are forced to live below the poverty line. Is this a flaw free enterprise, or is our monetary unit we call the Federal Reserve Note forcing us into perpetual debt, ensuring inflation and higher taxes? These questions and more can be answered by reading G. Edward Griffin's book, The Creature from Jekyll Island. Congressman Ron Paul states it's what every American needs to know about central bank power. A gripping adventure into the secret world of international banking cartel. Hi, this is Ted Anderson. I will give a silver dollar from the early 1900s to anyone who purchases this book. Call 1-800-686-2237 and order a copy today. It's critical that the public be made aware of the system. Call and order your copy today at 1-800-686-2237. That's 1-800-686-2237. On Facebook, on the news, and in conversations with friends, we're bombarded every day with advice on how to be healthier, from gluten-free and non-GMO diets to how much exercise and sleep the body needs. But how much have you heard about alkalizing the body? AlkaVision Plasma pH Drops are a holistic and natural way to get your body's pH levels back in balance. Just a few drops in water will help your body rid itself of harmful waste. And even the healthiest of diets can be complemented with your daily use of AlkaVision Plasma pH Drops. Who isn't looking for more vibrance, vigor, and energy? Now buy two bottles of AlkaVision Plasma pH Drops and get $10 off your order. Visit AlkaVision.com or call 800-518-7615. AlkaVision Plasma pH Drops are packed with a powerful combination of the most alkaline minerals and compounds. Open the door to greater health, vitality, and zest for life. Alkalize your body, supercharge your health. Call 800-518-7615 or head to AlkaVision.com. What good is a big Berkey water filter? 
We get that question a lot here at BigBerkeyWaterFilters.com, and in a word, the answer is protection. Protection from water main breaks, E. coli contamination, environmental chemical spills, pesticide runoff, chlorine taste and smell, and all forms of fluoride. Plus, Big Berkey Water Filters are the original gravity water filter system and most trusted on the market for a reason. Tested by multiple independent NSF EPA certified labs, they are the gold standard in water purification. At only 1.7 cents a gallon, a single set of filters can last for 5 to 10 years. That means big savings. Big Berkey, the one that's powerful enough to purify stagnant pond water. Get a Big Berkey today at BigBerkeyWaterFilters.com. GCN listeners receive 5% off all ceramic filter systems. Visit our website or call 1-877-99-BERKEY. That's 877-99-BERKEY. Big Berkey Water Filters, for the love of clean water. We'd like to hear from you. If you have a comment or question about the Paracast, send it to news at theparacast.com. That's news at theparacast.com. And don't forget to visit our famous Paracast community forums at forum.theparacast.com. Okay, early 80s, you're giving this lecture to some Air Force people. I think think there's a society of old crows or something like that. I forget the exact name they call themselves, but there were mainly criminals in the Belgian Air Force. And after the lecture was over, some old guy, compared to me, uh, looked like he would be in his 60s, he says, you, you can't talk about that stuff or words to that effect. He was, he was uh, uh, I don't know if he'd known in advance what the lecture was going to be about, but he was essentially uh, admonishing me against talking about UFOs. Uh, that's the closest I ever got to uh, being told I should shut up. Of course, I wonder in situations like that, where if they talk to people like you and say something, you might report to the public what they did, and that just makes you look more credible. Well, yeah, I think this guy's comment was probably spur of the moment on his part. And, of course, I, 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 I noted the comment and uh, basically ignored it. Went right on talking. I went on, went and talked to a, another guy who had a, was an Air Force captain, I believe, who said that he had been in charge of a missile base in Utah, and the same thing had happened at his place. Let's just move in our final three segments: catch as catch can to other subjects. Okay, we think about this now because there may be another Clinton vying for the White House very soon. The reported interest by the Clintons in UFOs dating back to the 1990s. Some observations? As you know from reading the book, I ended up uh, writing a briefing for the uh, President Clinton's science science advisor. Right. In 1993, a few months after Clinton had uh, taken office. Uh, That was a result of um, Lawrence Rockefeller and Scott Jones. Uh, Lawrence Rockefeller, I presume everybody recognizes the name. Scott Jones was a uh, active as a UFO investigator, uh, as far as, and, and he was the head of the so-called Human Potential Foundation. Uh, a long background on Mr. Jones, but in any case, they were they wanted to brief Clinton on what was known about UFOs, it's sort of an attempt to get some presidential level disclosure going. And they they knew uh, Scott Jones knew. Givens personally, and uh, told Givens they want to get a lot of time with Clinton to talk about you. Well, he didn't say initially what it was. And um, Lawrence Rockefeller was a big donor, so of course he could get time anytime he wanted, practically. And so they made an arrangement with Givens that they would pre- brief Givens. He said, you, you, you can talk to the president, but you have to get it past me, in effect. So Lawrence Rockefeller and Scott Jones uh, made an arrangement to talk about UFOs to John Gibbons, and Gibbons was petrified, according to Pandolfi, uh, the thought of losing credibility by talking about UFOs. So I was I was unaware of all this until uh, 13th, I guess it was, of April, and I was at home doing some work, and uh, I got a phone call from Pandolfi saying, uh, I want you to write a provide a briefing for John Gibbons, the President's Science Advisor. At which point, I, my jaw sort of fell to the floor. Is that uh, obviously a, 
an amazing opportunity. So I immediately I started thinking about typical presentations take a week or more to get develop all the view graphs and the script and everything else that goes along with it. So then Pandolfi says it's got to be ready, ready by tomorrow. And uh, I began wondering how in the world is it going to do this. And then he said it's got to be faxed to the uh, Gibbons office uh, by 8 o'clock in the morning. So I sat down and wrote out what I could in that amount of time and uh, sent it at 8 o'clock in the morning. And a few hours later, I learned that the meeting had been held at 7.30. <laughs> Typical governmental situation. My briefing paper had no impact on whatever the, the discussion was when Lawrence Rockefeller and Scott Jones actually talked to Gibbons. Well, why do you think that the whole subject didn't get legs and actually uh, become a talking point uh, in the administration? It, it almost seems like it, it just totally disappears from uh, from the scene from that point on. Well, it didn't disappear from that point on. Anybody who knows what Grant Cameron has uh, collected, or, or you can write under the Freedom of Information Act, all the papers generated about UFOs at, at the White House, the Rockefeller push, you might say, Went on for another year, a couple of years. I think it was '95 or '96 that. Uh, yeah, I'm saying after that there. particular initiative, uh, it seems to have disappeared off the radar uh, for the uh, most part. All right, yeah, all right. After after '96, there was nothing. If that's what you mean. Supposedly, Clinton and uh, Mrs. Clinton were briefed when they were on vacation at Rockefeller's ranch in Wyoming. After that, you don't hear anything about it. Right. And that was about the time that I, I uh, met Rockefeller, and he did express his frustration over uh, the lack of, of, of response by the administration. The, the whole issue seemed to have kind of spun its wheels and then, and then just, you know, like I said, fell off the radar. And he was, he was very frustrated by that because he thought he had put together, you know, some slam dunk information that would be impossible for the president and, his, uh, and Givens and, and others in the administration to ignore. I was at a, uh, we had a little mini conference, I guess you could say, at Rockefeller's Ranch in the fall of 93. Uh, and uh, I and a number of other people gave presentations there uh, on the subject and various aspects. I talked a lot about the New Zealand case, for example. And um, so far as I could tell, there was no net, no net result of, of that. Uh, I, I was. I was advised by my boss that his boss had wanted me to write some UFO or send him up some UFO documents because they had heard they had a request from an, a Navy admiral who uh, Lawrence Rockefeller and Scott Jones knew. I don't know who it was, but this Navy admiral had called up the captain in charge of the laboratory where I work and asked, "Is Bruce Mack be crazy?" or words to that effect. And so that question worked its way down through the ranks to my boss. <laughs> and my boss didn't think I was crazy. So, uh, and he said, the captain of the lab wants to read some of your work. So I sent some of my uh, best writing up the chain of command of the captain. I never heard anything else about it after that, but I guess they decided, since, since I wasn't fired, I guess I, they decided I wasn't crazy after all. So, so they decided you were sane after all. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> okay, so that explains it right now, Chris. That's why sometimes in my life I've worked at a job and they've decided they'd rather have somebody else do that job. So maybe they determined that I was a little bit too crazy for it. No, I'm not saying that. <laughs> now, let me tell our listeners we have that new service, plus.thepowercast.com, the Powercast Plus, P L U S dot the Powercast dot com. If you join up five bucks a month, $50 a year, you get the ad free version of the show. None of those inserted ads, higher resolution and extra content. In fact, we're going to introduce a new segment called After the Paracast, which will be an irregular segment where Chris and I just talk shop and sometimes talk about the show without interruptions, without a clock. But the clock is moving right now. We've got Dr. Bruce Maccabee with us. I'm Gene Steinberg with Chris O'Brien. You're in the Paracast. Not just an alternative to the mainstream media. We're the premier independent talk radio network. We are GCN.
Graphic Converter is the image manipulation tool for the rest of us. It does not use any database, so you get full control of all your files. Want to view the images of a folder? Drag it into Graphic Converter, and a powerful browser opens up to show your image files. You could use it for slideshows. You could use it to import images from digital cameras or from scanners. Need to do some image editing? You can do that too in Graphic Converter. Also, print catalogs convert from so many formats I can't even list them. Download now to see if Graphic Converter is good for you, like one and a half million other users. Guess what? You could save money when you buy Graphic Converter. Use the coupon code NIGHTOWL. Use the coupon code NIGHTOWL to get a special price for Graphic Converter. Go to LemkeSoft.com. That's L-E-M-K-E Soft.com. LemkeSoft.com. L-E-M-K-E Soft.com. We all know that Berkey Water Purification Systems are the most trusted name in water filtration. As an authorized Berkey dealer for over six years and serving thousands of satisfied customers, the Berkey Guy offers amazing specials for Berkey Water Filtration Systems. The Berkey Light Systems include a set of self-sterilizing and recleanable black purification elements that purify water by removing chlorine, pathogenic bacteria, cysts and parasites to non-detectable levels and remove harmful chemicals such as herbicides and pesticides. Order the Berkey Light Systems system today complete with two black Berkey elements for only $231 and the Berkey guy will ship your order free of charge. With the purchase of a Berkey light, the Berkey guy is also offering a set of fluoride and arsenic filters for only $39.99. That's over 30% off the retail price. Call the Berkey guy at 1-877-886-3653. That's 1-877-886-3653 or order online at goberkey.com. That's goberkey.com today. Hi, my name is Scott Fuchs, teacher and rowing coach for over 14 years. I was sluggish, overweight, on prescription drugs, and only 30-something. Fortunately, I was referred to Dr. Z, and happy to say Dr. Z's all-natural protocols over a consistent course resolved my health issues. I'm in the best shape of my life, and most importantly, on zero medications. I'm Dr. Zdanowski, author of Evology, trained as a primary care physician, surgical manipulation under anesthesia, expert in nutrition, diet, weight loss, immune system, and I specialize in chiropractic. My 15 years of professional experience has taught me the four keys to vibrant health, a balanced muscular skeletal system, an integrated nervous system, a flowing lymphatic system, and a body filled with over 90 essential nutrients. This has been a secret too long. Actualize your potential, reverse disease. Call me, Dr. Z. 201-945-1177, 201-945-1177, evolveyourself.com. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Three square meals you'll need in an emergency. So the Freeze Dry Guys three square meal unit sale is just the ticket. A variety pack of tasty, nourishing breakfast, lunch, and dinner on sale now. Breakfast is Freeze Dry Guys favorite. Hot oatmeal and sweet dehydrated bananas. Lunch is Mountain House freeze dried hot macaroni and cheese and crisp green beans. And dinner is Mountain House long grain wild rice pilaf and hearty beef stew, vegetables, and gravy. Call Freeze Dry Guy and ask for details on the 120. 26 serving three square meals unit. One case normally 164.37. Sale price at only 138.90. Save over 25 bucks. Get two or three cases and save even more. Or ask about Freeze Dry Guys Fall Chili Special. Always free shipping to the lower 48 states. Call 866-404-3663 or click freezedryguy.com. And hurry, the Fall Chili Special and three square meals unit are on sale while supplies last. From the Freeze Dry Guy, the finest freeze dried and dehydrated foods available for long term storage. Period. This is Jacques Vallée, and you're listening to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. This is the Paracast with Gene and Chris. We're going to go on with lots and lots of discussions in our remaining two segments. Dr. Bruce Maccabee. Since we brought in the issue of President Clinton, do you think any of the presidents have any real knowledge of what's going on about this subject? Well, I don't want to leave that standing. Well, a few presidents who have been part of the intelligence community, community may know. Typically, you know, why would you tell a president he's going to be here for no more than eight years? 
maybe only four years, and he's primarily interested in the political situation. One doesn't know how a president might react to learning that, so why well, take a chance? Why, tell, why, why would the intelligence community tell any president uh, that UFOs are real and we've got crash disks and all that sort of stuff? Because it introduces a new uncertainty into civilization. If there's one thing that civilization can't stand, it's uncertainty. What about in the early years when UFOs were first becoming ubiquitous? What about President Truman, Eisenhower? Do you think maybe they knew more than their successors? They may well have because they were the top of the uh, uh, intelligence communities and, uh, and uh, as they were president. I suspect that uh, the uh, main informa major information went quickly underground, but there were enough people aware of um, first -hand, had first-hand awareness of the subject, either by sightings or knowing people who had sightings. Uh, there were enough for top-level people who knew that uh, it didn't change, wouldn't change much to tell, uh, tell them the, the, the truth. They were already coping with whatever the implications of the truth were. Let me just ask you a quick question about that, though. And that is, in the event something happened that forced the issue, a mass landing or something, wouldn't there have to be a contingency plan to sit the president down, his national security people, and say, oh, by the way, we didn't tell you this before? Yeah, well, uh, certainly the, the, that feeling may well have occurred during the 1952, the summer of 52, which I call the year of the UFO, uh, when there were sightings coming in. On July 26th, or whatever it was, uh, there were something like 50 sightings in one day uh, from all over the place. Uh, and at that point, they may well have thought that the invasion was imminent. Uh, and they could have told Truman what was going on. But, uh, well, I don't know. It's a question you can only speculate on. Well, we do have a number of questions uh, at forum.theparacast.com in our question thread where our listeners, Bruce, can ask questions of our guests, and we do have some in here. This one comes from Randall, uh, who uh, calls himself Ufology. Uh, he's one of our most uh, <laughs> prolific posters. He's well over 5,000 posts at the forum. And he's wondering, in your 1990 book, The Gulf Breeze Sightings by Ed and Francis Walters, you wrote, in my opinion, this is not a hoax. After an extensive investigation, I've concluded that everything described here actually happened more or less as they have described it. Today, are you still of the same opinion? And if not, why not? I'm still of the same opinion. Okay. <laughs> that was a, a short, punchy answer. Well, I, I outlined the reasons for my, my belief. I was certainly aware of all the criticisms and uh, stuff related to double exposure hoaxing and everything. Uh, uh, went on, was uh, accused the accusations against Ed Walters and so on, and I tried to outline my reason for believing that uh, things happened that he could not have hoaxed. Uh, and so anybody who asked that question, I presume, has the book and therefore can read my chapter. Uh, there's other stuff on the uh, on my web page. Uh, one case in particular, January 8, 1990, which was a multiple witness case with photography uh, that involved Ed, but other other people too, uh, which I find uh, quite stands apart from her reciting that happened in 87, 88. Uh, but anybody who wants to uh, can read that on my website, www.brumac.8k.com. Okay, so you're saying because of all the other sightings that were taking place uh, during that same general time period, that is an indication to you that there was activity down there and it couldn't all have been generated by a person like Ed Walters uh, hoaxing uh, photographs. Also, the fact that there were 100 or more other witnesses, it would be illogical to say that uh, uh, Ed, was, uh, Ed was hoaxing all the pictures. And at the same time, except that any one of the witnesses who claimed they saw the same thing was all was was telling the truth. Uh, in other words, Ed was guilty by photography, to use his phrase. If he hadn't taken any photos, 
it would have been like anybody else's uh, um, sightings, I guess. Right. Well, here's here's another question that we have. Uh, this one's from Blowfish, who's been a poster at forum.theparacast.com since January of 2010. And he's he's speculating, uh, kind of riffing here a little bit, and he's wondering do, if you think there are two types of space programs controlled by China, Russia, and, and the USA, one that's a public relations program and another one that's secret and military run. Uh, I'm sure there are secret military programs, but they've gone much farther than uh, the uh, the known programs. It's hard to say. I, I could I could only speculate, but I remember back in 1980s going to a uh, 1980 of uh, plus or minus a year, going to a week long seminar uh, for uh, budding young uh, program managers. Uh, in which all sorts of things were discussed, and some references were made to what, was, what they call the Black Shuttle. This is when shuttles were just beginning. And uh, the Black Shuttle presumably was uh, an Air Force project uh, that was uh, secret. Uh, I, never, I didn't pursue that at the time, so I don't know how far these uh, top-secret uh, military spacecraft could have gone, but at that point, uh, they were, as I said, they were talking about the Black Shuttle going to be starting up sometime, which would have been in the 80s. Well, Bruce, what do you think of this movement uh, within space uh, program to privatize and go with uh, with corporate uh, entities uh, like uh, SpaceX, Elon Musk? Um, orbital Technologies, uh, you know, Robert Bigelow in his uh, Bigelow Aerospace. Do you think that this move into uh, the private uh, sector uh, is going to help divulge uh, information about UFOs, uh, possibly uh, artifacts on the moon, for instance? Or do you think that this is going to further hinder any sort of disclosure? Well, I don't think it'll have an impact on disclosure unless one of these organizations runs into something absolutely convincing. I said, like, a, uh, if they discover a, a, an obelisk on the moon <laughs> uh, or something like that, um, if somebody crashes into an unknown uh, alien spacecraft and uh, uh, they get pieces of it, uh, I think it would take something pretty convincing to uh, have an impact on one of these programs that you're just talking about. But uh, the, the real question is, if they ran into something, were they, is there a fine print in a contract that says, if you come into, run into something that's clearly alien, you have to give it up to uh, such and such a government uh, organization? Well, that makes sense for, for the U.S., but what about uh, China? What about India? Do you think if they come up with some sort of uh, amazing slam dunk evidence of artifacts on the moon, let's say, as an example, do you think that they would release that information just to embarrass the United States or to put pressure on the United States, possibly to disclose uh, more openly uh, their, the extent of their knowledge? Let's have the answer our next segment, the final segment with Dr. Bruce McAbee and Gene and Chris. You're in the Paracast. UnseenNow.com, proud sponsor of GCN. Unseen Now's unparalleled encryption tools keep your communications secure. GCN. Attack of the Rockoids has been well received by critics and readers alike. It's a thrill a minute story you'll never forget. A former U.S. military intelligence officer is haunted by intense dreams about a beautiful woman pleading for his help after a terrible battle in outer space. But the dreams turn out to be true and thrust him into a telepathic love affair with a woman whose faraway planet is intent on destroying the Earth. And now the gripping tale continues in The Coming of the Protectors. It's the second book of the Rockoids trilogy, a galaxy-spanning adventure that pits our hapless heroes against powerful, fanatical enemies that threaten the lives of freedom-loving beings everywhere. Attack of the Rockoids and The Coming of the Protectors. Classic science fiction at its best. Available now. 
For more details, visit rockoids.com. That's R O C K O I D S.com. We all have our own idea about what being safe and secure means. The door's locked, bills are paid, you've got a job that keeps the lights on, and a home to call your own. But what happens when Mother Nature throws a curveball? I'm telling you, just take cover. Are you prepared to live without electricity or passable roads for weeks at a time? Do you even have a plan B? If you do, are you willing to bet your life on it? Children left with no homes. And no one's coming to help them. help them. The first step towards self-reliance in the face of disaster is a visit to MyPatriotSupply.com. There you'll find the absolute best prices on storable foods, non-GMO seeds, emergency water filtration devices, and so much more. All orders over $49 qualify for free shipping in the lower 48 states. Call 866-229-0927. That's 866-229-0927. And speak to one of our preparedness advisors today or visit us at mypatriotsupply.com remember before it's time to survive it's time to prepare don't complain about your cable bill going up and up and up. Do something about it. Grab a pencil and jot down this special number. 1-855-905-MY-TV. The more cable TV rates go up, the better digital satellite TV looks. Say goodbye to the cable guy. And get more of your favorite channels in 100% digital quality for less money. Call 1-855-905-MY-TV. Sign up for packages starting as low as $19.99 and there's no equipment to buy. You get free HD TV upgrade, a free DVR upgrade, and free professional and installation you control what you watch when you watch it record your favorite shows pause and rewind live tv even skip the commercials watch local channels too at just 19.99 what are you waiting for pull out your major credit or debit card call 1-855-905-MY-TV 1-855-905-MY-TV say goodbye to the cable guy cut costs and get more 1-855-905-MY-TV 1-855-905-MY-TV If you need to say happy birthday, happy anniversary, thank you, or simply I'm thinking of you, ProFlowers.com is the key. ProFlowers has stunning bouquets, like the best-selling 100 blooms for $19.99. Plus, ProFlowers will include a glass vase for free. Sending someone a wonderful surprise of beautiful flowers sent fresh from the field is easy. Choose the bouquet you like, pick the delivery date, and each order is 100% guaranteed. Plus, all bouquets from Pro Flowers are guaranteed to last at least seven full days. Beautiful, fragrant flowers, picked fresh and sent to your loved one for lasting enjoyment. To get this incredible savings and send someone 100 gorgeous blooms with a free vase for $19.99, go to ProFlowers.com, click the blue microphone in the top right corner, and enter code PLOW. That's ProFlowers.com. Click the mic and enter code P-L-O-W. This is Jerome Clark, author of the UFO Encyclopedia and other books. You're listening to the Paracast. Remember, plus.theparacast.com, plus.theparacast.com. Sign up for our premium plus package, $5 a month, $50 a year, and we'll be adding some new special features, okay? New special features, including after the PowerCast. Chris, you want to go through that question one more time for Dr. Maccabee in our final segment? Sure. Because we're seeing other countries like India and China starting to go to the moon, uh, have a more robust uh, presence in space, do you think if these countries discover some sort of slam dunk uh information that's uh you know highly sensational let's say artifacts on the moon would be the obvious example do you think that they would uh disclose this uh to embarrass the united states possibly or to put pressure on the united states to be more forthcoming about our knowledge of uh what's really going on with ufos and uh supposed visitation well first part of the question ought to be would they release the information anyway whether to embarrass the United States or not. Uh, there may be some secret agreement that if they run into clear, clearly alien technology somehow or other, they're going to keep quiet about it. Uh, yeah, they, they, uh, they might release it. I don't know if they say, oh, Vidi, we can embarrass the United States by releasing this information. If, this, if there's something about this information that 
has convinced the U.S. government that it shouldn't be released, that same information probably would convince the Chinese or the Indians. Sure, but what about the Iranians? What about these rogue nations? Do you think they will have the same concerns? What about North Korea? Well, it depends on the information that's being withheld. I don't need yeah. to speculate. Yeah, they don't have space programs, Gene. I mean, if we're, if we're which they sure, did. but that doesn't mean they don't have information. Maybe it doesn't mean that a UFO can't crash in North Korea or in Iran or in any of these other countries. You know, they have UFO sightings too. Sure, if a UFO crash in Iran, would they run and tell the United States that we got one, or would they cover it up? I don't know. They sure didn't cover up and somehow managing to hijack one of our drones there a few years back. <laughs> but that's not that's not impossible technology or, or an impossible sighting. Uh, they're starting off from the point of view that UFOs don't exist, therefore they, they, you can't get a crashed one. If a crashed one comes along, then this changes the whole game, and they may follow along the same line of thought as uh, the Air Force, U.S. Air Force did back in 1947. The bottom line would be, is it, uh, I'm Chinese or I'm Iranian or I'm Afghanistanian or I'm South Africa or wherever. Is it going to do me any good to release this information? And the answer to that, of course, is going to depend upon the person's culture, background, and all sorts of stuff. If they, if they conclude that it's not going to be a good thing, they probably won't. Right. In other words, there's got to be a, a, a real plus uh, side. A payoff somewhere. Down. Follow the money. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, Blowfish has another question here, and you know, you bring uh, you brought up uh, several very uh, important cases uh, that you discuss at uh, some length in your book. He wants to know what is your best UFO case that you've investigated during your research, and he also mentions that he has uh, bought your book and that he really enjoys it. He says it's a very good read. So, what were you going to say? Uh, Favorite case. Probably the most important one I've investigated is the New Zealand sightings because of the, the amount of data left over. Certainly the uh, Greenville photos, 1950 here, very interesting. I got a lot of stuff on my website about that. Those are that's an interesting photo case because it's either a real thing or a hoax. There's no halfway point. And, but you only have two people making a claim and a photograph. In the New Zealand case, you've got multiple witnesses to uh, that were flying on this airplane multiple witnesses to appearances and disappearances of, of lights around the aircraft. You've got a tape recording made on the aircraft by a reporter. You've got a 16-millimeter color movie made on the airplane by a uh, movie ca uh, cameraman. You've got the pilot and the co-pilot and uh, a sound recording person. Uh, you have radar data as well. And you also have the ground radar. And you have some instances... One instance in particular of ground radar where the uh, plane is flying essentially southward away from the radar, and um, the radar is picking up a target behind the aircraft, then it picks up a target on the right-hand side of the aircraft. Then suddenly the aircraft target gets twice as large as it ought to be. Now, I've written a big paper on radar analysis and how this is essentially an impossibility unless you actually have some radar reflective object close to the aircraft. To, to sort of like stretch out the uh, um, the little arc that's made on the radar screen, so that's that's an impossible radar case. Something was there, 